My name is Jimmy Su. I have a nickname as Big Head. I'm a formal high-level member of the largest triad, Sun Yon. This I decided to leave my life because I got sick and tired of it. And I almost got killed in 1992. I got shot five times. Do I know the person who shot me? Yes, I know the person who shot me. But I don't know why he shot me at that time. How many triads in Hong Kong? I can tell you there's a lot of triads. Sun Yong, 14K, uh, Sing Wo, Sui Fong. My situation is a bit special because I'm not in Hong Kong, I'm from New York. Okay, and in New York, I already have a lot of soldiers under me. When I joined the Tong On gang in Chinatown, New York, a couple of former members in Tong On, they are from Hong Kong. When they in Hong Kong, they already are triad, Sun Yon's member. So after they come to the United States, they still have a connection with Hong Kong triad. Because some things happened, I got arrested on uh, 1985, remember, okay? So after I got out, the couple of members I mentioned before from Sun Yon, they asked me, hey, Jimmy, you want to you know, go to Hong Kong with us? Maybe you can, you know, go outside and have some fun first because you're already inside for two years. I went back to Hong Kong with them. They took me to a restaurant and tell me way over there. And then afterward, a guy come down, but he didn't look like a triad leader, nothing. He looked like a businessman. You never mentioned this guy is the leader, okay? So the leader asked me a couple of questions, like, uh, what do you do in New York? Uh, what's, what's your position in New York? And uh, I tell him the whole thing. So he's saying that like, uh, okay, because I already have a lot of soldiers at my under level, okay? All the kids who, you know, who follow me, they will become a Sun Yon too. For the ceremony, there's a incense altar on the table. We have to square a lot to the God or something, and we have to drink blood wine. And then the first thing they were saying that I was spit out in Cantonese because I don't know how to translate in English that one. Wang Chun Ki Yi Lao Guan Zhang, Yi Sam Wu Guo Hei Yang Yang, Gam Yi Hing Dai Lai Ki Yi, Kao Cheng Dai Guan Zheng Dong Chang. The rule for the triad, the main rule is like you obey your boss. Of course, you obey your main boss. There's only one main boss for the whole group, so you must obey him. And never, never against each other. And never steal money from each other. And never lie to each other. And never take girl from each other. <laughs> My boss gave me, as I remember, two, two light clubs to collect money every month, which they call a protection money. The shareholder must be like one or two shareholders for the light club is our member. In American, you can say that extortion, but they were willing to give our money for the protection in, in uh, American. But in Hong Kong, you must be a shareholder for this light club, and then you have your own people to, to protect the club, I tell you, honestly, I tell you, we are there every night, at least 20 days a month. We got used to it, like, just like going to work, okay? Just like every day about time, we were like, okay, let's go to this light cup tonight, let's go to that light cup tonight. Every night is like that. That's the gang life. For me, uh, I got two light clubs to collect. Every light club, they give me 20 grand each month. So a month, I get like 40 grand without doing something for two small light clubs. But for the big one, as I know, they pay like uh, 100 grand a month for each general. Back then, the triad business always production company, building alley, that's a legal business. And for the underground business, maybe money laundry, maybe drug money, 
they have business right here. In the United States, in New York, in LA, they have business all over. Back then, I can say every gang in Chinatown, they have connection in Hong Kong. They all have connection in Hong Kong. The general from the other group, they start a business of drug traveling. Back then, it's very easy to, you know, smuggle the drug into the United States. Maybe they have some girl member in the gang. They tell the girl to go back to Hong Kong and pick up something and bring it back in. At that time, it's very easy. It's not like right now. When the time I'm in Hong Kong, the movie business, I can say that it's all controlled by Triad. If you don't listen to Triad, you cannot get a spot, not even a spot. You don't listen to them, okay, you will get punished. There's a movie star come out saying that, like, I don't want to, I, I'm not a triad, whatever. You believe them, you believe them. Okay, but for me, I don't believe them. A lot of famous movie star, which is female, they are triad members. A lot of people don't know, and we know. Every gangster got a nickname because we don't want to use our real name on the street. Easy to remember, I got big head and my name's Jimmy, it's too simple. A lot of people call Jimmy. So they won't forget, they always call me Big Head Jimmy. They have a nickname for Monkey, they have a nickname for Tiger Boy, uh, Fat Boss. They have all kinds of nicknames. Uh, they have all different kinds of handshake. Like different position, they have different kind of handshake. Sometimes we do this, and then you show it your hand side, and then they know what's your position. Maybe the guy who's talking to, he's a soldier. And then you show him the, the hand side, he's, uh, you are general. And then he don't know what is general hand side because he's only a soldier. So he only can show the soldier hand side. So if I saw it, uh, you're only a soldier, I don't want to talk to you. Tell your boss to come out like this. They don't use that no more, only the old generation. The generation after the 2000s, they don't care. They don't care about this. They just care like how many people you have, what kind of power you have, how much you got. In Hong Kong, I never go out with myself. If I go to this light club, at least like 20, 30 people who follow me go into the light club. So they knew. They knew you were, you were the triad. We got experience. We can tell who's a triad, who's a cop, and who's a businessman, we can tell. For Triad, they have a couple kind of level. But for Sun Yi On, the member on the top level, they are all controlled by one family. No other people can take their position. Every generation, they will pass down like father and son, son and son like this. So it's all controlled by one family until now. After the top level, the second level is the general. We call it 426. After the 426 is the soldier. For the soldier, they call it 49. And after the soldier, that's the people who hang out with the soldier every day, but they are not a member yet. They call it Bull Lantern. This is the main structure of the triad. Of course, they have a lot of different position, like White paper fan, that's the guy who, who controls all the money. That's the other position is for uh, passing out the message. <laughs> a special guy doing that. Now, at this century, a lot of position is gone. So only got left is the top level, general, the soldier, and the bull lantern. I only saw my boss in Hong Kong like two or three times. I know his family member. When I get to the you know, general position, the boss will give you a couple plays, like a couple of business plays for you to collect money every month. That's our salary. I just make sure they are doing the right thing. They don't, they don't you know, step out of the nine. And that's what I did. If somebody step out on the nine, Okay, um, there's so many people in the, in the group, so many people. Always things happen because you cannot control everybody. 
I never did that before, but what I heard, the worst thing, they got killed. That's the worst, okay? If they did something, you know, against the, the company, against the group, okay, they will get killed. After me, I have like a couple of soldiers, they are in the group for a long time, they have experience, who know who control all the kids, they are doing all the management. So this thing won't happen. But sometime in the other group, this thing did happen. That's why I heard. Hong Kong is real small and uh, too many triad members. They all have their own district. Like you control this part and 40K control the other part. But you know how the gangster is. They always want to increase their power. So they step in the district, is controlled by the Sun Yon, and the war going to start. When I in Hong Kong, I saw another general in uh, San Yon. They have like something going on with a general in 14K. They start the war, they, they want to take their territory. Yeah, I saw that before. But this always happened in Hong Kong and back then. Back then, in Hong Kong, they always, you know, start a war, but they don't use gun. They always use life. Because in Hong Kong, the, the firearm law is very strict. Even though they have a gun, they hardly go to bring the gun outside on the street. Almost impossible for people to get a gun license in Hong Kong. When the time in Hong Kong, who use the guns, always the gangster from China, from mainland China. Okay, they bring the gun from China and they use it in Hong Kong, and they went back to China. But for the original member in Hong Kong, they hardly use the gun. Okay, maybe, maybe the lower, lower level guy, but not the general. And if I start, we don't get involved. Only the soldier who start the fight. If we saw something and uh, we know the, the war going to start, we back off. And then the soldier forward. Our different triad members, they are together to doing something. Yes, always. It's money talk. Easy, it's money talk. With one general, he think he cannot, you know, take the whole cake and he want to share out with another member or share out with different group. He will do that. Hong Kong is real small, I tell you. So you have to friend with other good too. Back then, in Hong Kong prison or Macau's prison, the whole prison is running by the triad. The triad got more power than the correctional officer. In the 60s and 70s, all the police was corruption and with the triad. Okay, they work together. Until now, no. Impossible. You can. It's very strict right now. You do something they don't like, you will disappear forever, and uh, people cannot find you, and uh, you're not you are not facing a jail time, you just disappear. I decide to, you know, quit my gangster life. I got shot five times. And after that, I say, no more. I got sick and tired of that. Because I'm getting old, uh, the way I think is different. So I want to return to my normal life. So I quit. I know the person who shot me. But I don't know why he shot me at that time. Afterward, I found out. Because my soldier under me, who people under me shot they remember uh, two weeks ago. So they know I'm the general of them. So he shot me. That time I was at home and I went out a cigarette. So I have to go down and uh, try to buy a cigarette in the grocery. When I closed my driver's side door and I check out the side mirror, I saw someone came out. From, uh, from a car behind. And then he start to shoot. And then the ambulance come like after at least 15 minutes, as I remember. They brought me to the ambulance hospital and they do a surgery 
And then the doctor come by and show me the other bullet and tell me that we took four bullet out and uh, still a bullet inside your body. So I asked him, why don't you just take the next one out? And uh, he was telling me that because that bullet is went into your bone. So uh, that bullet will stay there forever. That's what the doctor say. What do I have to do to leave? Actually, nothing. I just tell my soldier, because I have like a couple of soldiers who control all the kids already. I just tell them that start now, all the street money, the gambling house money, whatever. I go give up everything. You guys, you know, take care of the under level people and uh, anything happen, you don't have to ask me. Even though after I left, I start working and the FBI come to me, ask me a question. I say, I don't know nothing. I left already. That's it. In the 90s, you know, the FBI, all the leader, all the gangster got arrested and thrown in the prison. Without our help, they cannot stand in the United States no more. And then they back off and now disappear. <laughs> The first beginning of triad, okay, we call it a town, Hong Moon. Hong Moon is the first one. After that, they split out from Hong Moon to all separate triad. They call it triad for the three big river in the southeast area. So inside that area, they call everybody a triad. Government people, they call them triad, and then they start to call themselves triad too. Sun Yeon in Hong Kong is a largest triad almost in the all Southeast Asian area. At my time, they have like 200,000 members and all over the world. It's, they have a pretty long history. For all the high level members in Sun Yeon, they become a businessman now. They do an Egypt business or undergrounding. It's only for the lower level member. I was born in 1965 in Hong Kong. I was born in a district called Yao Ma Dei. Inside Yao Ma Dei, there's a street called Temple Street. At that time, the whole street is controlled by the triad. So when I was real young, I already know what is triad. And my father saw that I was getting worse, my behavior getting worse. So he decided to immigrate the whole family to the United States. At that time, there's a gang called Ghost Shadow in Chinatown, always waiting outside the school every day, like uh, after school. They try to do something to us and uh, try to scare us and tell us to join the gang. If we don't, we have to pay them money every day for protection. But we keep refusing them. One of my classmates, he told us that we should go look for his cousin, Clifford Wong. And he's the leader of the Tongong gang. My classmate got killed because the fly dragon, they thought my, my friend, he's belonged to the Tongong gang. But which that time we are not. So we asked Clifford Wong for help. And uh, he said, Mice, you guys just join our gang. So officially, we joined the Tongan gang. I started in Tongan gang member when I was 14. When I become a member of San Yon, I'm 22. So I was already in the gang life for like eight years already. We have a channel in a YouTube Chinatown gang story. We start to tell the true story about a gangster life. We want to do the best we can to find, you know, every former uh, gangster member, no matter what level they are, to tell their true story. So let the world know what the gangster life is. I just want to say that for the new generation, don't trust anybody except your parents. Don't trust any movie story, you are not a hero in the gang life. Uh, if you really in the gang life right now, only two final results. First, 
you go end up in the prison doing time. Second, you go get killed. My name is Robert Mazur. I spent two years undercover laundering tens of millions of dollars for Pablo Escobar's cartel. This is how crime works. Money laundering enables cartels to produce the most lethal thing that they produce around the world, and that's corruption. It enables them to be able to control countries, presidents of countries. Operation Sea Chase was a multi-agency task force to prosecute the biggest money launderers of the Medellin cartel. Most of the people I dealt with were high-level drug traffickers who had hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm doing this interview in silhouette because two agencies and an intelligence agency informed me that the Medellin cartel issued a contract on my life. I spent a year and a half putting together what I think is one of the more sophisticated fronts used in undercover. I built the persona of Robert Musella. I dressed the part, certainly had the lifestyle, drove a Rolls Royce, Mercedes, Jaguar. I was embedded in real businesses. Had an air charter service with a private jet. We had a jewelry chain with 30 locations on the East Coast. A lot of cash goes through the Diamond District every single day. So if you've got those kinds of businesses, you have a very good excuse for where the cash came from. I was embedded in an investment company, a mortgage brokerage business, and even a brokerage firm with a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. And then I and my partner began a two-year infiltration of the Medellin cartel and the banks that were supporting them. One of the keys to doing undercover work is to build your undercover persona to have as many traits as you do in common. Robert Musella was from Staten Island. I'm from Staten Island. Robert Musella was a businessman. I have a business background. I didn't fake accents, fake anything. I was always just me. The first person I met that was working within the Medellin cartel is a gentleman by the name of Gonzalo Mura, a small-time money launderer who had an import-export business, but the capacity he had to launder was probably limited to about $50,000 a week at best. We had my partner, Emir, deal with him and simply say, listen, my boss handles a lot of this, but he never wants to meet you. He wants to stay in the shadows. But if you could ever convince him to come out of the shadows, the rivers would open and you'd be able to launder untold amounts of money. By the end of that six months, Gonzalo Mora was banging on the door to meet me. You know, it's always best to play hard to get. I also knew these people have a sixth sense. If you're afraid of a dog, they know that. You're the first one they bite. I didn't want to get bit. So uh, I knew that I would be working against myself and undermining my cause if I showed any fear whatsoever. And I told him eventually, listen, I have to get these people to understand that they need to let me invest some of their money. Your only responsibility is to introduce me to them. If I succeed, we'll even do business bigger. He felt compelled to make the introductions, and then I started to climb up the ladder to meet bigger and bigger people. You know, money launderers, like I played the role of, um, are basically operating what's called the black money market. It's an informal banking system that's made available to people who operate through the underground. So as a black money market operator, I have a supply of dollars. My supply comes from drug traffickers. Now I have to find people who have a demand for dollars. People who wanna buy dollars are oftentimes importers around the world who otherwise have to go through their central bank and spend 25% of their money to officially get dollars. I could sell it to them for 10%. My traffickers, in many instances, wanted Colombian pesos. So the best people I could sell those dollars to were Colombian importers. All I have to do is swap. So I have supply clients, traffickers, and demand clients. But most often the money would wind up into bank accounts controlled by the cartel in Panama. And from there, they distributed it around the world 
wherever they wanted to hide it. Well, sometimes the money had to be used to buy planes. Like there was a guy, his responsibility was acquiring the aircraft and trucks and things like that, that the cartel needed. So he basically was the buyer of the cartel's air force. So I dealt with him because he needed money in order to buy the specific planes they were looking for, which were Rockwell 1000s and Rockwell 980s. Some money is smuggled out of the United States down to Colombia, and it's used to make payoffs to people in the military or prosecutors or politicians or whoever's help they need to buy. Most of the money's in five, tens, and twenties. That's because people using illegal drugs buy it with five, tens, and twenties. That gets collected by people who have a responsibility here for the cartels to do nothing other than collect money. They try not to have traffickers and money handlers in the same place. Too much asset to potentially be lost. So the dollars generally would come to me in suitcases, duffel bags, boxes. New York was a key point get a million, two million dollars per delivery. I generally had runners who picked it up and brought it. You don't usually get the guy who really controls the safe on the street. The way it works is we get the information from Gonzalo Mora. So he might give us a phone number in the form of an invoice number. He might say that, you know, you need to get in touch with Guapo and he's gonna have 250 boxes. It's 250,000. They generally like to meet in a public area. So it might be at a McDonald's. They sit down, not much gets said, pushes the keys across the table. It's in the trunk. Amir goes and gets the money. It's usually wrapped in rubber bands in blocks of 5,000 and 10,000, depending upon denominations. You know, a lot of people say, wow, isn't it tempting? You know, you've got all these millions and millions of dollars and it's in cash. There's unfortunately been people in just about every agency that has uh, fallen victim into a slippery slope of uh, greed. My motivation was information became my heroin. If I couldn't get the next big piece of information and I couldn't risk more than I did to get the last piece of information, I felt as though I wasn't accomplishing my mission. Yeah, I was addicted, but I was addicted to information. Layering is a process um, by which a series of corporations, usually offshore entities, are used to continue to receive what initially started off maybe as a suitcase full of cash. The way we layered, uh, the money would first be put into a certificate of deposit in Luxembourg in the name of an offshore entity. That money was used by the bank as collateral for a loan in a different part of the world. So let's say the loan was in Paris, and that was to a Gibraltar corporation. And then that Gibraltar corporation would transfer the funds to Panama, and then from there to accounts controlled by the drug traffickers. And so the purpose that you use layering for is to just confuse the route in which the money is being moved. In order for anyone to trace the money backward, you have to first pierce the corporate veil in Panama and bank secrecy laws. Then you have to pierce the same in France. Then you have to pierce the same in Luxembourg. You know, a lot of times what they do, if they don't want to deal with a person like me, they will use an army of couriers, call them Smurfs, the little blue guys, Smurfs running all over we kind of dub them Smurfs because let's say there's 10 of them. Their job every day is to go to meet with their money contact. And that guy may have $500,000 in the trunk. And each of them gets $50,000 and a map that tells them where it is locally they can go to use cash to buy money grams, cashier's checks, money orders, traveler's checks, they'll buy a money order for $987.25 to try to make it look like it's for a payment. Leave the payee blank. They generally don't want to buy anything over $3,000. So at the end of the day, $500,000 that filled the trunk was now a stack of maybe eight inches high of money orders, traveler's checks. There were times when those were offered to me to then take it from there and launder it. That was safety for them because 
we were not having direct contact with their main money people. We were just getting a FedEx box with $500,000 in money orders. I think the biggest deposit was somewhere around 2.1 million. There was a time that I met in, in Paris with Pablo Escobar's main lawyer, a guy named Santiago Uribe, and some other people that worked directly with Pablo. He sent Uribe to assess our money laundering processes. And at the end of that meeting, we came to an agreement. We would receive in a relatively short period of time, $100 million that they wanted to put into a nest egg uh, in Europe in case they had to flee. So when we get back from Europe, we started getting deliveries, a million in the morning, two million in the afternoon. I had told the people who were doing surveillance that they needed to be really careful and we needed to try to keep it as light as we could because they would have counter surveillance out there. And one of the people who I dealt with, the person who met with Pablo Escobar often told me, make sure your people look on the street for gringos, white guys, who are in their late 20s, early 30s, in good shape, wearing jeans, pullover shirts with collars, solid color, jogging shoes, fanny packs, that's where their guns are hidden. Those are los feos, the ugly ones. That's informally what people in the cartel call the feds. So I never used to want to go into an office, but this was getting very important, so I met with the people who were gonna do the surveillance. And there was a room full of gringos with jeans, pullover shirts that were solid with collars, and they had fanny packs. And I tried to convince them that that was a uniform that everybody was looking for, but egos are such in uh, law enforcement that sometimes uh, people don't wanna take that advice. So anyway, the surveillance got burned. And the next thing that happened is that my partner, Amir Breu, received a phone call from Gonzalo Mora. And in the background was a screaming voice of Gerardo Moncada, Pablo Escobar's main manager, who was screaming that Musella, I, had to be a DEA undercover agent because they saw all the feds there and all deals from here on were off. And I had to talk myself out of that. I guess the point is that um, there are a lot of different moving parts to these undercover operations. And um, it's pretty easy for any one of us to do something that might potentially endanger somebody else on the team. All of the traffickers said to me, you know, I love your money laundering system, but the end payout is US dollar checks from accounts that are in the United States. We want you to open up US dollar accounts in Panama. Panama uses the US dollar more than it does its own currency. They know that secrecy is big in Panama by corporations, by banks. It's harder for DEA to get the information concerning the accounts. But what they told me also was, listen, we want your accounts in Panama because we own General Manuel Noriega and he will not touch any of your accounts because you're with us. So now I have to open up an account in Panama. I happened to be driving past a branch in Tampa of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, the seventh largest privately held bank in the world. It was a big gold sign. I would have never walked in there if it wasn't for that. And they said, well, we'll give you a meeting if you can give us a resume. I had a fully verifiable resume and I had bank accounts with millions of dollars in it, all of which um, the bank in particular wanted to see before they opened up to me and explained to me how they laundered money uh, for many people in organized crime. And I said to him, all of my clients are from Medellin, Colombia. They operate businesses here in the States that are very sensitive. And it's my job to very cautiously help them to move capital across borders. So he goes, well, that's the black money market. We have plenty of customers who deal in that business. He said, you know, yeah, Panama is where you want to be. There's a lot of hands in which these checks go through. And sometimes, mistakes can be made. And in fact, that's the way I got really inside the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. That got me into the inner circle of dirty officers in BCCI, and then I went on to meet more than a dozen of them. The number one person who managed my accounts, a gentleman by the name of Amjad Awan, he managed accounts for people who ran countries, for Manuel Noriega. He helped launder Noriega's drug profits from the protection he sold to the Medellin cartel. And during that time, we recorded about 1,200 conversations, all of which were used as the cornerstones of the prosecution 
of not just drug traffickers and money launderers, but senior officials of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. I needed to coast the conversations into the areas where I was exposing their true intent, their involvement in criminality. I couldn't allow them to dance around issues. You have to try to get a way to have the conversation. So one of the things that I used during that time frame, one of the most famous businessmen at the time in the late 80s was a guy by the name of Lee Iacocca. He ran Chrysler. Everybody knew who he was. And so when I would talk to people, especially at the bank, I would say, you know, if my clients came in this room, you might mistake them as being Lee Iacocca. The big difference is they don't sell cars. They sell Coke. I dealt with dirty bankers. I dealt with lawyers in Switzerland who formed corporations to hide the source of our funds. I dealt with attorneys in Panama, people who ran financial service corporations that do nothing other than form tens of thousands of corporations for people all over the world. They provide nominee directors that hide the beneficial ownership of accounts and the control of corporations. All of these people are intermediaries who the underworld counts on. There were other people, real money launderers at that time, who were sending what they claimed to be precious metals in and out of the United States, which actually was lead that was covered by gold. And that was their cover for why they were depositing cash and were not bashful about it, talking to the bank and saying, you know, this is a cash generating business. You know, if you have enough that's believable, it's amazing how quickly they'll convince themselves that you are who you say you are. June of 1988. I was told that it would be the first week of October that the operation would be taken down. I've got two years worth of work to do and I got to get it done in about three months. You know, so many times these undercover operations result in indictments, but the bad guys, they're in countries that do not offer uh, extradition. Colombia was one. Someone suggested, well, why don't we have a some kind of a personal event. One of the agents said, you know, well, they obviously appear to like Bob. How about a wedding? So we put this together for a supposed wedding in Innisbrook, which is a country club. This got personal. You know, in some instances, children of future defendants were part of the wedding, wives. And the night before, one of my informants went around to the defendants and said, hey, Bob doesn't know this. We're going to have a bachelor party. The cars will be here soon. The arrest team's there. They arrest them. Everybody was in disbelief. And the case concluded with the arrest of about 85 individuals, the collection of fines and forfeitures of about $600 million, and the seizure of about 3,000 pounds of cocaine. Ultimately, the bank imploded on the night of the arrests. You know, it was all high fives. They wanted to go out and have a celebratory gathering. I wanted nothing to do with that whatsoever. I was emotionally exhausted. I first learned about the contract on my life about 30 days after the undercover operation, Operation Sea Chase was over. The longest trial lasted six months. I was on the witness stand. I could see the hatred in their eyes, even more so and the eyes of their family members who were there. No doubt, you know, they didn't see me as a person who was just doing their job. They saw me as a person who tricked them, but I never tricked anybody into doing anything other than trusting me. Uh, nobody in there did anything that they hadn't done before. After I testified, my family and I uh, rented a motorhome. We went into the mountains, uh, got away from everybody and tried to heal. There was a a uh, pager number, an 800 number that they could call, the office could call and leave me a message and occasionally I would check. And I got word that the jury had convicted every single person of virtually all accounts. I went back to the uh, campsite by a river and um, just sat there thinking about it. And it occurred to me that it was so surreal that I had done the same things that the bankers had done and I was getting awards, and they were about to go to jail for a long time. And I don't take what I did lightly. Some people think it's a sign of weakness. You know, I did drop a tear or two that day. I kind of think 
that was good because I want a government with conscience. I don't want people high-fiving. It's unfortunate, but the law enforcement community and the private sector responsible for trying to attack money laundering have been highly unsuccessful. The United Nations on Drugs and Crime estimates that roughly $400 billion is generated each year from the sale of illegal drugs. What I really do believe needs to be done, you have to understand there are two different sides of banking. There's the sales side and the compliance side. Sales side brings in the accounts, compliance, in an unhealthy bank, only does the background to make sure they're not dealing with a bad guy. That needs to be brought together. I'm suggesting it only on accounts that have $5 million or more that have been received in a year. I think that the account relationship manager that brought the account in should have to file with the bank a sworn statement affirming that they've asked certain questions, questions that if you ask them would expose whether or not it is an account that's being run by front people, those questions don't get asked. And they don't get asked now because the sales side always tells the compliance side, if I ask those questions, we won't get this business because they don't want to answer those questions. You know, we have a joint terrorism task force run by the FBI, but is also participated in by, I don't know how many hundred agencies, there should be a joint money laundering task force that does the exact same thing. You know, there has been an evolution of cryptocurrency. There are people who've been involved in the drug world who have used cryptocurrency. Unlike cash, you can follow crypto. The other problem you have with crypto is you only need to look at Bitcoin and see that unlike the US dollar, its value is not stable. I don't think it's really ready for the big time in the, in the, in the drug world. What is big? Gold refining in the Middle East, Dubai, that's big. I retired from undercover work after the second operation when I almost got killed, and that was in the late 90s. I'm extraordinarily grateful to have the platform from which I get the opportunity to speak. And that platform is first a book called The Infiltrator that became a New York Times bestseller and, and the basis for a film by the same name starring Brian Cranston. And then subsequently, uh, a book I wrote this past year came out called The Betrayal, a nonfiction book about the second undercover operation that I did. But as long as I've got that platform, I'm gonna do everything I can to try to share information um, that can in some way um, try to help us with the problem we face with this massive illegal drug problem in, in our country and around the world. My name's John Mendoza. I'm a former member of the Nuestra Familia prison gang. I was a category three and I was a regimental commander in different parts of Northern California. And this is how crime works. I've been to San Quentin, Pelican Bay. In the early 90s, they put us out there with Southern Mexicans and the Aryan Brotherhood, the Nazi lowriders, those were our enemies. They were putting us out there on the yard together and we were going out there fighting. If you, know, you were crafty enough to bring a weapon out, we'll try to kill each other. I went to prison in 19, 1988 when I was 18 years old. You know, some of my older homeboys that were there in, in the county jail with me basically told me that, you know, when, when I get to San Quentin, that the NR is gonna approach me about making a commitment. I knew who to look for. The first time I went out to the recreation yard, there was a group of individuals that were in the corner that were covered with tattoos. Those were the NR members. From that point on, they put me on a, on a 90 day probationary period. It's like you're functioning within that movement, but you're not an actual member. You can do anything that they ask you to do. Stabbing somebody, keeping security on somebody, holding paperwork, holding a weapon. A lot of guys that make a commitment because they want the status, they want the title. Those guys are gonna end up getting weeded out because they're not making the commitment for the right reasons. They're not true believers. I was an NR member for about five years, six years. People take notice when you're functioning that long and you're not questioning authority, you're developing into a leader. Eventually the NF is gonna approach you because the NR in essence is like the NF's training grounds. I think it was 1994, I was approached by two high ranking NF members, Smiley from Salinas and Mike Eel from Salinas. Induction process is similar to the NR. 
you go through an indoctrination process where you learn some of their their concepts, their bylaws. You have a sponsor and you have the guy that actually pulls you. They're responsible for you. When you make a commitment to the NF, it's a lifetime commitment. I was asked things like, are you willing to kill your own flesh and blood? You know, are you willing to put the organization first before everything else in your life? Everything else that you were loyal to becomes secondary. They write everything down. There's 14 bonds, which is, I used to call it like my little toolbox. Everything that I needed to know how to function within that movement. Conduct, discipline. You're encouraged to study things like Middle Eastern philosophy, Socrates, revolutionary uh, literature like George Jackson, Che Guevara. And then there's everything that you need to know about how to make weapons. I can make a stabbing instrument out of 15 pieces of paper. It's all about how you roll it and then how you put the point on. When your membership is sanctioned, there's not no big ceremony. They'll get together with you, maybe in a group setting out there on the yard. They'll say something like, um, today, we're, you know, we're welcoming the brother uh, Boxer in. Me, I was right there in San Quentin on the yard and it was done similar. Hey, this brother's a carnal now. You know, he's a familiano from this point on. He's a member of the mob. It's like I felt like I reached a pinnacle, a point in my career where I had really accomplished something. Everything that I've done, it was all worth it. When a new arrival will come in, we'll, we'll get his information, we'll get all his vitals, we'll get his name, his CDC number, we'll get a little bit about his history, we'll get things like his AKA, his age, his, his, his neighborhood, what they called him. We'll look on the BNL to make sure he's not on the BNL. So the BNL, the bad news list is we keep a, a roster of everybody that's coming in and out of that household. I'll send a filter out to all the, the members that are in that household and I'll ask everybody, you know, have you done time with this individual? This guy just drove up, you know, do you know him? Any good or bad information that'll get filtered out. If nothing comes back, he'll be welcome into the household. Then at that point, he'll be given a care package, uh, soap, shampoo, coffee, toothpaste, things like that. When you first come in to an ad seg or even a main line, they give you what's called a 114 lockup order. That's like your passport. The gangs, they're gonna ask you for that. But the only way you're gonna get a lockup order is if they freely give it up. That's the only way we're gonna get it. It's gonna say on that lockup order, whatever gang that you're affiliated with, it's gonna say things like if you got an S on your your um, jacket, like a sex offense or something, it's gonna, it's gonna say it right there. So somebody like that, you know, they, you got an S, you're, you're, they probably wouldn't even give up their 114 lockup order because they already know what time it is. If you decline to give up that information, you're done. That's somebody that refused to comply with the program. Somebody like that's not gonna be welcome out to the yard. If he tries to come out to the yard, he'll get hit at the gate. I mean, obviously there's there's a lot of perks with, with becoming a member like that. You're gonna get that rock star status kind of treatment from a lot of the youngsters out there on the streets and in prison. They look up to you. They call NF members just like they call Mexican mafia members, big homies. Well, you're gonna have a lot of, of access at money. I've learned a lot of things that um that I still hold to this day, even though I'm not a part of it no more. You know, things like conducting myself um, a certain way. The NF is built, it's, it's constructed or built under a paramilitary structure. A lot of the, the old NF members came from the Marines, they're ex-Marines. So they actually took a lot of the, the structure of the leadership in the military and brought it to the NF. You have like captains, lieutenants, commanders, a category one or for members that are just coming into the organization. They have no status over anybody else. Then you have a cat too. They've shown that they have leadership potential and they can give a correct interpretation of the constitution. They'll become teachers for the cat ones. Now, in order to become a cat three, this is the cream of the crop. You need to be voted in. Then you have the inner council and the general council that basically make the decisions for the entire organization. You have a general for, for the prisons, you have a general for the streets, and then you have a general that's it's basically like a internal affairs. He handles investigations, um, internal disputes, things like that. When you're in the shoe, you might be in charge of like 200 guys. You're not really running the whole prison. 
There's guys out there on the main line, regimental commanders out there that are doing that. But on the streets, if you're a regimental commander out there, it might be 20 or 30 guys. I was a regimental commander all over Northern California, different parts. Each time there was probably around 10 to 20 members that were under me at that time. A day for me, well, it depends. Like San Quentin, you're running H unit in North Block, West Block. I would have to sit there and answer some investigations. So you're getting daily filters or weekly filters from all these different blocks. All day long, I would just be getting inundated with kites. San Quentin is the worst place to be as far as being a leader. The main rivals for the NF are the Mexican Mafia. They're following the Sureños. And then you have the Aryan Brotherhood and they're following the whites. But on the main line, it's mixed. Everybody's mixed out there. The Norteños, the Sureños, the Blacks, everybody's mixed. If you're talking about in an ad seg type of environment, a shoe program, everybody's kind of segregated. I spent all the 90s in the shoe program. When you see us out there on the yards and we're doing burpees and we're doing exercises out there, we're not out there doing that because we're just trying to get karate bodies and <laughs> just trying to, to look nice, right? We're training for a war. That's what it is. They're getting ready to go to the shoe programs. They're gonna be engaged in a conflict. So the shoe program is like a prison inside of a prison. They put you in a cell and you stay in the cell about 23 hours a day. You'll come out of the cell you know, for a half hour to take a shower. And then you might come out for yard and you come out to a yard that's, you got four concrete walls and a camera. That's all that's out there. You got plexiglass on the top. If you see a bird fly over, you're like, damn, I seen a bird today, man. You go back in there and tell people in the pod. In the shoe program, they got what's called a nerve system. Everything is, is electric up there in Pelican Bay. They sit up there and they push buttons all day. You know, you got a one cop up there that's in charge of six different pods. So he might forget somebody's in the shower or he might forget that a, a door is open and he'll press another button and somebody else will come out. You could be in there w watching TV or working out one minute and you'll be out on the tier in a fight for your life the next minute. It happened just that fast. So us as North Daniels, you know, all day our mattresses would be rolled up and we'd be sitting by the door. I mean, I get up and I work out, I watch my TV, but for the most part, whenever there was movement or activity on the tier, I would be posted up on my door ready just in case my door would open. Because a lot of times the COs would say it was a mistake, but it wasn't a mistake. You know, they pop certain doors open for different reasons. I used to see them. I used to watch from myself. There's a lot of different places out there on the yards to bury weapons inside the buildings up on the, like in the little rafters, we obviously know where they're at, under sinks or in the walls, buried. They, they keister it, you know, to, to move a weapon from one place to another, they'll put it in their anal cavity is, is how it's moved around. I don't know how you wanna put that out there. But. So I went through, through Cork and Shoe Wars, um, back in the, the early 90s. We were going at it with the Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood. You know, they knew we were mortal enemies, that we would kill each other if we had a chance, but they would put us out on the yard and they knew, the administration knew over there. You'd have to have your light on and that meant that you wanted to go to yard. Guys used to turn their lights off because they didn't want no part of it. But those of us that remained active, we turn our lights on and we go out. It's like a little enclosure before you get out to the yard. And the yard's like a little, it's, it's kind of shaped like a piece of pie. When you get in that little enclosure, you can see through the yard door who you're gonna go out there and get off with. So we go out, we fight, always try to get yourself situated so that they have their back to the gunner so that you can see what the gunner's doing. Because we were the ones that were getting targeted. It was the Northerners and the Blacks that were getting shot and killed over there. There's no warning shots per se, but what they have is they have like a, it's called a Bertha or a knee knocker. It's a like a gas gun that fires little wooden blocks. Sometimes they'll fire once, twice, and then they'll grab the, the, the real gun. But yeah, they don't, they don't give warning shots. Now the other thing though too is, is the COs are making bets. 
they would be like, hey, we got we got we got money on you guys, man. You guys better go out there and do your thing, man. You know, sometimes they would take their best fighters from one building and they would take the best fighter from another building and get them out there. When I first came in the system, I was young. I used to mean mug them. I used to have a, a bad taste, you know, for certain individuals. And I didn't even know why I hated them. It was because I was supposed to. That's the mindset that was instilled within me. But being around them, a lot of them were just like us. They were solid dudes. If there's a Sureño and he needs some toothpaste or I got a book and he wants to read it, you know, we'll pass literature back and forth to each other. We can play chess on the tier. It doesn't do us any good to make that environment any more stressful than what it is. Now, like I said, if the gates open, we were directed to basically torpedo out and engage with whoever was on the tier. If we were gonna take off on staff, the guards, our politics might get set aside for a bigger purpose um, to where, yeah, we might come together to go against the administration. You might see something like a small uprising within an ad seg unit or something where we're not getting fed right. They're tearing up our cells and, and disrespecting, you know, personal possessions like pictures and things like that, where everybody says, you know what, we had enough. Let's just all board up, blocking the, your window so that they can't see in there, which basically forces them to have to come in there and cell extract you it's something that I, I was personally involved in before in Susanville. You know, when we were going through the cork and shoe wars, people might uh, debate this, but a lot of the COs were split as far as who they favored in that war. Even some of the female officers, it's just, you could you could tell that they, they, uh, they were either sympathizing for the North or they were sympathizing for the South. A lot of it is just, is geography, where, where, where that prison's at, whether or not they got family that are, you know, that might be hooked up. So it just depends. Corruption, it's rampant in the county jails. I mean, you see a lot of relationships that happen where female officers are getting into relationships with inmates. The next thing you know, they're bringing in drugs. <laughs> they're not getting that kind of stuff into the visiting room. They're getting it through corrupt COs. In prison, one of the things that is a huge problem are the cell phones that are coming in, but it's a huge business for COs. They can make anywhere from $1,000 to 4,000 bringing in a phone, a cell phone. Having the phones, is, it's it's a lot different because again, when, when I was in the shoe program back in the 90s, you had, when we'd be back there plotting somebody's murder, there was a lot of lag time that was involved. Either it had to go out through a letter, a coded letter, a phone call, or a visit. And you know, you'd have to wait maybe a week or two for somebody to drive three, 400 miles to come see you up in, up in Pelican Bay. But now you put these cell phones in the hands of these leaders. If somebody's got a, a green light on them, they'll make a phone call. You'll get the, a leader that will call a figurehead on the streets and will it will happen in real time. Hey, this dude's got a green light on him. He's got to go. It might happen that same night. Let's say somebody came on the tier, I was on the tier in the ad seg or something, and he was like six cells down. I make verbal contact with him. I yell down there, hey homie, that just came in. Hey, yo, once you get situated, go ahead and make a line so that you know I can get at you. Making a, a line is where you take the elastic from your boxers or from the strands from your sheet. You'll make a, a line and you'll tie them together so that you can put a weight at the end of it and then you, you'll throw it down the tier. It's just like a way to get back and forth to the cells. So he'll tie the kite on there and I'll pull it in and I'll read it and then I'll respond to it and he'll pull it back. Ingenuity, there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to do things like that. Covert communications, there's a language that we use in there is called Nawa. It's an Aztec language and there's different dialects, but we use it so that if we're on a tier and we need to communicate and there's other officers on the, there's officers on the tier, we can talk on the tier in front of them and they're not gonna know what we say. There's very few people that know the whole, actual, the whole language. They'll, they'll just know certain words like weapon, drugs, CO, hit, green light, things like that. Northaniels, our color is red. 
Sureños, they wear blue. So the NF insignia, the sombrero, obviously it signifies the Mexican heritage. You got the dagger that signifies that this is a violent organization. And then each drop of blood characterizes its own individual meaning. So one drop of blood is for blood in, guys that have spilled blood coming into the organization, blood out, um, meaning anybody that tries to walk away from the organization it's an automatic death sentence. And then the third drop of blood is for members that have honorably spilled blood that have died in the course of you know their career. I had Nuestra no Familia tattooed on the back of my head and I got that covered up. I had a star on my hairline when I had hair. That signified the NR. I had Familiano over my left eyebrow being a family member in Spanish. And then I had a Tattoo on the back of my forearm. Um, I had an NF back there. The whole purpose of generating money is supposed to be for the less fortunate members, you know, that are doing life in prison that don't have a means to take care of themselves. That's what it's supposed to be. It's a smoke screen, though. There's no trickle down effect. There's a trickle up effect. The money that comes in, it goes to the leadership, the select few at the top of the hierarchy. And they're the ones that, that use that money for their own expenses. You know, some of it's used to invest in drugs and to invest in new uh, regiments or new territory that the, you know, breaking NF ground out there on the streets. If I got a visitor that's willing to bring in drugs, off the top, my gang is gonna require whatever, 25% of it, 50% of it, or I might even have to turn, turn it all over to them and they'll give me back what, you know, they feel that they want to give me. You know, you're part of that gang. You're going to take care of that gang or, the, or that criminal organization. The biggest thing in, in prison, county jails, the biggest, the currency in there is soups. Everybody loves soups, top ramens. That's like a prison or jail currency right there. But, you know, obviously then you got weed, tobacco, then the hardcore drugs and things like that. White Lightning, you know, like a cup of that. It can go for like $50, but you're talking about like a cup of something that's like vodka. I learned early on from a young gang member that the more violent I was, the more blood that I spilled out there on the streets, the more respect I got. The fastest way to elevate yourself within the organization is by hurting people. So out on the streets, the, the, the structure you know, you have your regimental commander, a second in command, your squad leaders, and then your, your manpower. You know, I would have a second in command and he would be my buffer. He would collect the money. He would make sure that everybody's following policy, you know, issuing out the drugs, the guns that were coming in off the streets. That was to kind of keep me uh, insulated. In the 90s, when it was a lot different, the regiments were called colonias back in those days. Everything was compartmentalized. You had a robbery crew, Another crew that would sell dope. You had a, a wrecking crew. I think the influence has waned over the years, like a lot. In the in the eighties and the nineties, you couldn't testify against the NF and, and live in the same county. You wouldn't even want to be in California. The the threat was it was very real back in those days. But once the three strike law came into effect, we kind of stepped away from the violent crimes and started doing it, almost exclusively selling drugs. The influence is there. People know that they're out there. They're in the cuts, they're functioning. It's just not as, as it's not like it was. I wanna say since like 68 is when the NF first came into inception. From that time on, that's when they took a stand against the Mexican mafia in South Block, San Quentin. This is basically when the NF banded together, decided that they weren't gonna be abused by the Mexican mafia anymore. And from that point on, that's when the war started. So for almost the next five decades, that war was in effect. The truce actually started back in the, in the shoe program in Pelican Bay, the end of uh, hostilities, their agreement. Again, the whole purpose of it was for a lot of these guys that had been in the shoe program for some of them three decades, it was to get back out to the main lines and to basically show CDC that they could, you know, live on the same yard without killing each other. 
So I thought it was a temporary thing. It was gonna, they were gonna get out there. Somebody was gonna push a line somewhere and it was gonna kick off and then it was just gonna be a domino effect. But it's lasted. I mean, honestly, I never thought in my lifetime that I would ever see the day when Norteños and Sureños would be out there on the same yards, playing basketball with each other, walking laps with each other. But at the same time, there was a lot of house cleaning. Guys that had issues, internal issues within their respective gang were getting dealt with. Whether it was over misconduct, um, something came up in their past or something like that, there was a lot of house cleaning. And then there was a lot of guys that didn't agree with, with the peace treaty. They felt like, you know what? I didn't sign up for this, man. Um, you know, what, what are we doing? What about all the brothers that, that have spilled blood in the past? I think the violence is worse. When they let these guys out of the shoe program, all these leaders, guys that are from the 70s, from the 80s, when I came to prison, they're starting to bring the old school back where they're not just poking people and slicing people up no more. You see all the murders that are happening out there. You know, the Mexican mafia, the NF, they're behind it. They would rather eat their own right now, stab some of their own people. I mean, it's crazy. The politics that are going on right now, Everything's going backwards. In 2004, I was arrested in a multi-agency investigation where I was the leader of a, of a street crew, an NF regiment. So I was the main target in that investigation. On the first day, on June 11th, 2004, they raided around eight houses that were all in relation to this investigation. On the first wave, they hit my uh, house where I had all my guns. They hit another house where I had all my money. By 2005, that case continued to snowball. They put me in an observation cell because they said I had too much influence with the North Daniels. So they wanted to keep me isolated. And during, you know, during that time, my whole concern was, you know, my girl, she had lupus. I was trying to do everything I could to make it easy on her. I knew I was in trouble, but I didn't want to tell her because she had lupus and for somebody like that, stress is a killer. So during the first couple of weeks, talking to her and my mom on the phone, I had some difficult conversations with them. You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to sacrifice yourself? You know, think about your family for once. You know, my mom kept pushing me to cooperate. She kept pushing me to cooperate. You need to cooperate. Do what you do. Your wife's out here dying. What are you going to do? And I basically started pacifying her, telling her whatever I needed to tell her. Let the case play out. It's, it's, I haven't even been to court yet. So what they do is, and understandably, they release my phone calls of how I've been talking to my girl. And all my co-defendants hear these conversations, you know, about cooperating. Trying to explain that to the NF, um, it was going to fall on deaf ears. Because of who I was, I was a leader. I get held to different standards because I know better. And I got no business talking like that. This is five years later now. People are still speculating that I'm cooperating. Come on, man, it's five years and there's no police reports, there's nothing. So somebody that had an agenda pushed the issue with leadership up in the Bay, they put a green light on me. Nothing happened. It was literally the dude that tried to, honoring the green light, tried to push a phone over in front of me on the tier. I still held my mud. I still want, wanted to be a part of the, of the organization. 17 months later, they put me back on the active tier. I functioned for another two years, put another green light on me. And the second time wasn't, it was just as bad as the first time. Somebody wanted to act like they were trying to spear me through the bars. The spear was like two feet, too short, didn't have a tip on it. You know, my wife, she died. She ended up dying. My mom ended up dying. She passed away. So they did this at a time when I was already in a dark place. You know what I mean? I'm looking at life. I was getting ready to plead out, but then they, they pulled that. So I was like, you know what? I'm done, man. The district attorney wants to wash me up. You know, I'm in bad standings now with, with the NF. What do I do? Law enforcement again came up and they're like, you know what? Loyalty only goes so far. Come on, man. I agreed that I was done and that, um, you know, that I would talk to him. So that's what I did from that point on. I, I denounced my membership and, you know, I agreed to cooperate. However, the cooperation that I gave was just, I didn't go in as a percipient witness. 
everybody that I got arrested with was gone. So I went in there basically talking about what I'm talking about now, how gangs work. The judge struck two of my strike priors, which took me out of the three strikes and gave me 16 years, eight months. I've been in the county jail almost 10 years. None of that had to happen. If the NF would have let me fight my case, I would have been a big dummy sitting in Pelican Bay right now with a life sentence. Yeah, I was one of the true believers. But, you know, by them pulling the trigger twice, I felt, I felt betrayed. For somebody that, that just doesn't want to be part of the organization no more, for them to walk away, to just ride off into the sunset and go on about their life and not hurt nobody, it's still not considered honorable, but it's, it's something that people will, will say, you know what, at least he didn't, he didn't tell on everybody. At least he didn't hurt nobody. But, you know, there, there's, no, there's never a retirement. You'll never be able to walk away in good standings. I've had a couple of situations where I ran into some individuals when there are 15 of them, that's when everybody wants to get active. But you know, when I catch cats by themselves, they're not trying to do all that, you know? And then I'm not, I'm not trying to look for trouble either. You know, I'm trying to just live, uh, um, live out the rest of my days without all the drama. I'm, I'm not gonna spend the rest of my life looking over my shoulder. I grew up in San Francisco, um, California. My mom was a, a young heroin addict. She got involved with drugs at a young age. At the age of 11, I found my way back to my mom's from foster care. You know, I found out she was using, and it, she didn't just give it to me. You know, you know, people are gonna be like, what kind of mother gives their 12 year old child um, heroin? I understand that, but I don't blame her, you know. I look at it as she was stuck in her addiction at a young age. She got stuck in that cycle and I kind of manipulated the situation. I told her I knew what she was doing and if she didn't give it to me, I was gonna go get it in the streets. And from that point on for the next 40 years, that <laughs> tore my life up in every um, way possible. From relationships to the things, the choices I would make, uh, me becoming involved in the criminal element. Um, you know, from then I stopped going to school. I started drinking. That's when I started getting involved with gangs. It started with burglarizing cars, ripping out the, you know, the radios, the speakers, selling them for drugs, robberies, home invasions. And then we started using weapons and it just continued to escalate. From that time, it didn't take me long before I got caught up in the juvenile justice system. I caught, uh, four robberies, one out of San Francisco and, and two out of San Mateo. I took seven years, ran consecutive, and they sent me to prison. My book is, I've met, you know, through, through talking to at-risk youth, I've talked to, to kids that um, have gotten in trouble probation officers come up and tell me that, you know, these youngsters, they read your book and we actually use your book as type of, like a workshop type of thing. The name of the book is called Nuestra Familia, Broken Paradigm. And so I started doing a YouTube channel, Paradigm Media News. I got a, a series on my channel. One's called Inner Demons and the other one's called War Stories. It's also therapeutical to talk about it, you know, to try to help some of these youngsters that might be, um, headed for that type of lifestyle. I give them the fine print that you, they, they don't hear about until it's too late, until they make a commitment and they find themselves in that situation. I've seen a lot of my homeboys uh, die throughout the years. Most of them are gone. There's only three roads you're gonna travel in this lifestyle. You're either gonna spend the rest of your life in prison, you're gonna die um, trying to push the organization's advancement forward, or you're gonna turn your back you know, there's no, there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow.
My name is Mike Moy. I was a former member of a Chinatown gang. I later became a NYPD cop. And this is how crime works. You had so many guns that's hidden all over the place, secret tunnels, and you have snipers up in the safe houses. A crazy person wouldn't even dare to go to Chinatown because even a crazy person, they feel pain, they fear death. So as far as being in Chinatown gang, you're either gonna wind up in jail or it's gonna be some outcome that's not gonna be good. So I was only 16 when I joined the gang, and it was one of the notorious Chinatown gangs during that time. There were a lot of rivals. In the 1970s, the Ghost Shadows and the Flying Dragons, those were the two main gangs. Eventually, you had the White Tigers, the Dong Wan Gang, the Fuk Cheng, the Green Dragons, and the BTK. The violence between the gangs, I wouldn't say it's because of territory. I would say it's because of uh, respect. Any form of disrespect warrants a killing, a shooting. Remember, these kids are young, 13, 15, 16 year old kids. All they want is for people to show them a little respect. Maybe it's because they insecure about themselves or they have a low self-esteem. It's all about respect. And a lot of people died because of disrespect. When we were in the gang, most of us at one time or another had some sort of interaction with the Italian mafia. Even I, myself, in my early 20s were dealing with guys in their 40s and 50s. But these Italian, young Italian teenage kids, they're the ones who were a problem to us. And there were some shootings where some of uh, our guys, we killed some of them. They walk around with their bats and canes and, and want to be tough. And they didn't know who they were messing with because we were never afraid. You know, we were like, we felt well like invincible. During my teen years, and we would do extortion, street robberies, petty stuff, petty crime. But then as I got older, got into my 20s, started selling marijuana, dealing with counterfeit money, credit card fraud, stolen credit cards from a source that we had in the post office. I opened gambling houses, a gambling house that we hung out in on Canal Street, right next to the Rosemary Theater in the basement. We would have poker machines from the Italians. They would put the poker machines in there. Sometimes we would have poker tables, pie gal tables, where we collect the percentage. So that was one of the uh, most profitable business I had. And also um, bootleg videotapes. Back in those days, the VCR tapes, those Shaw Brother Kung Fu movies, they made me a lot of money too. All we had to do was get a bunch of VCRs and copy those tapes. So we're talking about the probably around that time, probably the 80s and, and 90s. After the Italians lost the heroin business in the Pizza Connection trial, yeah, there was a vacuum and the Chinese took over. The Chinese were able to import high quality heroin into uh, Chinatown. They dominated that business for a short while. Just imagine how much money was circulating in Chinatown during those days in just a few block radius. I mean, you had cab drivers, waiters, waitresses benefiting from all that money, even factory workers, because the gangsters would spend that money into Chinatown. Yeah, they extorted from the stores, but they weren't out there to put the stores out of business, how the media portray us. All the business in Chinatown was flourishing during that time. Look at Chinatown back then. It never sleep. It's open like 24 hours. You get the gang members go into a restaurant during the Chinese New Year's, during whatever holidays, and the owner's gonna give them a little red envelope. It's just a little piece of what they're giving, less than what they probably pay for the garbage disposal, right? To the Italians, you know, we did protect the neighborhood. And I even have personal experiences protecting the businesses, you know, doing what I needed to do back in those days to, uh, protect the business owners from getting bullied by people who didn't even know better. Some of those people will remember me for the rest of their life. The person that you least expect to be a gang member, and that's the person that's carrying the gun. So when we travel in a group, 
For example, we go into a pool hall and we're shooting a pool. There'll be a kid in the corner of the pool hall watching over us, and that's the kid that has the gun. There could be a targeted hit where, okay, you're gonna go get this person and kill this person, yes. But a lot of times, uh, when they're in the streets, you can't control what they do. It's very easy to get a gun back in those days. I know uh, in the 70s, they had um, a source with the Italians getting guns from the Italians in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't that difficult to go out of state and buy a gun, just show your ID and you just, in the flea market, and you just buy a bunch of antique guns. Safe house are located all over. We had safe houses in Brooklyn, by Williamsburg, one by Midwood, Queens, by Woodhaven. So we had several places where we hold our meetings. At any given time, there could be as much as uh, 10, 15 people in that apartment, uh, sleeping there, living there. We kept it very low key, a side entrance, so it doesn't appear to be a lot of people going in and out. So the runners will go out there and buy whatever is necessary, whether it's food or, or drinks, uh, whatever they need. Generally, the police wouldn't even care about these things. What they care about are guns. But luckily, uh, we hid our guns in a way where the police couldn't find it. One of the ways what we did was we were on the second floor. So we were tying a string and lowered it down to the first floor. And so all you see was a string you know, on the floor. But who would expect when you pull up that string, there's a gun there. There's so many secret tunnels and places for them to hide guns. As far as the tunnels, you had them on uh, Ma Street, Bayard Street, Canal Street. Pell Street, Doyle Street, like these places. Those tunnels was used as a form of escape. After you do a shooting, you just run into the tunnel and just come out from the other side of the street. That's why there's so many cold cases in Chinatown. I was 16 years old when I joined the gang. You know, I saw it as a way to protect me from the bullies. During my years in school, I was like the only Asian kid. So I was a victim of bullying. How did I become a member of the gang? Initially, I started hanging out with them. And when they started to trust me, they know I was able to do things for them. That's when I um, got accepted. And they would give you a nickname, such as like Big Head, and say, hey, you have a big head, so we're gonna call you Big Head. And his Onion Head nickname came from his hairstyle. You know, the newspaper and the journals claim that Onion Head's nickname came from if you uh, betray him, he'll give you tears. That's why they call him Onion Head, but that is not true. He looked like an Onion Head with his hair cut back in those days. They tried to give me a nickname. I put a stop to it. You know, I'm that type of person. Uh, I like to stay under the radar, keep a low profile, and I was firm about it, and they respected that. But what they call me behind my back, that's another story. <laughs> and we did an initiation ritual together with two other members. We kneeled down and we lit up the incense. Uh, we poured wine in front of the general Guan and to give him an offering. In the wine was our blood. We picked our fingers. And after the initiation, uh, we felt like a certain bond like a brotherhood. What the Italians would call probably associate, you would call a um, Leng Zai, what the Italians would call a street soldier. We would call them uh, Ma Zai, like a captain, a Dai Ma, a uh, underboss, that would be uh, Dai Lo, which is big brother, the leader, Dai Lo Dai, and that would be the guy at the top. So how does one become a Dai Lo? Start out as a uh, soldier, and if you have the qualities of a Dai Lo, such as the gift of gab, you have the charisma, then you have these kids following you. You spend money on them, and once you have a crew, you become a Dai Lo. The Dai Lo would give the money to the Dai Ma. That goes to pay for everything, as far as entertainment, food, expenses, the safe house, paying the rent, the money trickles down to us. Unlike the Italians where the money trickles up, they 
have to pay for our loyalty. What we do in the streets, we basically enhance their reputation. A lot of people have the misconception that Tongs, Triads, and gangs are the same thing. It's not. The Tongs were former gang members in Chinatown who later tried to become a legitimate enterprise association trying to help the new immigrants coming into this country. But you have a handful of bad apples that associate themselves with the gangs and they use the gangs to do the dirty work. The Flying Dragons was under the Hip Sing Tong Association, the Ghost Shadows was under the On Leung Association, and the Tong On Gang was under the Tong On Association. The Flying Dragons had control of Pell Street, Doyle Street, and later on they moved on to Canal Street and Grand Street. The Ghost Shadows had control of Mott Street, Bayard Street. The White Tigers went to Queens, Elmhurst. Later on, the Tong On Gang was created, and they took control of East Broadway. Do the Chinatown gangs still exist today. Yes, they do, but they operate differently. A lot different than what I grew up with. There isn't a uh, Dai Lo, so to speak. There isn't a, uh, a big leader like how we had. They keep it totally underground. Back in those days, we dealt with a lot of federal crimes, crimes that want the attention of the FBI. The NYPD didn't have the resources to take on the Asian gangs. They didn't even have the translators available to translate. They were just uh, there to help the FBI, but it was the FBI that cracked these cases. It was around 1993. The FBI started rounding up a lot of people, and that's when it started falling apart. The people at the top was getting locked up. So the people at the bottom didn't know what to do. Most of the gang members were arrested by the feds or they were killed or in prison. That's when I made the transition. And in order to make that transition to go into the NYPD, it had to be like a light switch. It was like an on and off switch. It was either all or nothing. You know, I grew up watching Beretta, Kojak. What happened to Stephen McDonald, if you follow his story, he forgave the kid who shot him. And when Stephen McDonald mentioned that this kid was a part of his environment, did a lot of self-reflection and I see that how I grew up, you know, it made me who I am and I, maybe I need to change. So I joined the NYPD in 1995, but the gang was always there for me up until that day. When I took the oath, I left everything behind. I was assigned to work in Chinatown, so I didn't expect to be working in Chinatown, my old stomping grounds as a gang member, and that was um, a little bit nerve-wracking because what would happen if I bumped into my rivals or my fellow gang mates, and it did happen. I bumped into my rivals in uniform. I bumped into my former gang mates in uniform. Even when I was uh, assigned to the detective squad and I got promoted many years later, some of these uh, guys came out from prison and I was assigned to arrest them. Some of them couldn't make a living, so they started doing home invasions and robberies, robbing uh, stores and taxi cabs and whatnot. Uh, they started in getting involved with different type of rackets now. Uh, they didn't get involved with the heroin trade anymore because the feds were watching that so they got involved with other things like the transportation business, the dollar vans, the bus going out of state. They still did their gambling houses and the prostitution houses were run differently as opposed to back in those days where you would go into a prostitution house and you would see 10, 15, even 20 girls. So what they did was they uh, broke it up into like uh, an apartment, you know, and they would only have like maybe one or two girls. The gangs were operating a lot differently. Nobody wanted to call themselves a Dai Lo anymore. I love the NYPD. NYPD gave me everything I have, you know, for all those years. It's just that I had a bad experience while working with some bullies in the NYPD. That left a bad taste in my mouth. So it was time for me to leave. 
I left July of 2021. After over 26 years, I started this channel called Chinatown Gang Stories to get these stories from former gang members who lived a life because there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of the information came from non-Asians, uh, movies, authors, and documentaries. My channel will give you an accurate description of what really happened in Chinatown back in those days. What the, I learned from being in a gang, just don't do it. Between social media, like the technology, cell phones, and plate readers, DNA, facial recognition, big brothers watching everything you do. So there's no place in today's society for gangs anymore. My name is Brian Sobolewski. I'm a former diamond thief, and I stole $2.3 million worth of gold and jewelry throughout New England. And this is how crime works. I would compare the jewelry business to the drug business in terms of how shady it is. You're never getting the diamond they, they tell you is there. You're probably buying junk most of the time. The markup is somewhere between five to 800% when you walk into a store to try to buy a diamond. I was 20 when this started, 25 when I was arrested. So it was a five year span. So you had my dad who was the mastermind. My brother, he was the muscle. I was usually the driver. I was usually the lookout. We had an inside guy. Bill was a friend of my dad's. So he would basically feed us who was a good person to go after. If we were going into a store, he would tell us where the safe is, what time the safe opened up, what time the guy would be there. He himself was a traveling salesman. That's how he knew everybody. We used Bill to place an order if it was a store, just so we knew that that product would be in the store and we'd have a certain amount that we'd be able to get from the store. The landscape at the time was, you had a lot of mom and pop jewelry stores. You didn't have a whole lot of chains. There was K Jewelers, there were a couple of like major chains, but they were, most of them were independent and they had traveling salesmen with their product line in their car and they would travel to these stores and try to sell to them. We tried to hit anybody that had claimed false insurance or false robberies prior. We never went after anybody clean. And it, that's very hard to find in the jewelry business. You'd be surprised how many of these guys are reporting fake robberies and taking the insurance money. Casing a job is, it's maddening, but it's super, super, super important. It's about recognizing traffic, what time a patrol car might go by. Um, all of this stuff fed into what time of day we would do a job, usually during the day. Um, we didn't mind crowds. Crowds could sometimes help you. People, you know, being interested in what's going on there. So for Seabrook, for the Woody job, it was basically, what time does he come to work? Where does he pull his car up? The Raynham robbery, my brother and I went into a Papa Gino's right next door, grabbed a slice, and then went back in the car and ate it, and everyone from Papa Gino's remembered us. Every single person. So that's one of the things about casing. You gotta notice, but you can't be noticed noticing. So the cars that we use were never ours. We would go back at night, take the car, we'd go into a mall parking lot, I would unscrew somebody's license plate, we would put that on the car, we would use the car, my dad would bring it back the next night. He'd just leave it back on the lot. You could never prepare for every eventuality. There would be no scenario that we could practice and go through that wouldn't eventually present some issue that we would have to overcome. I would go in as a customer based on being as average as possible, but I didn't like it either. It was nerve wracking. Having a duffel bag with rope, bolt cutters, just in case we had to cut a lock that we didn't have a key for. My dad would go in with his girlfriend. It sounds so sexist, but you, we needed to have a female. Most of the traveling salesmen that we were going after were males. So it wasn't necessarily about how many bodies we needed. It was more about what gender it was. One of the things that we had to do was make sure that we could get into the safe. We knew that if, if the insurance company protocol for you having loose diamonds and being able to sell them and have them insure them, is that every single time you go to that safe to bring a diamond out, that safe gets relocked. 
But my dad did it in a way that he kept sending the guy back and forth from the safe that eventually the guy would just leave the safe open. And most people didn't follow the protocol to the letter. So once we knew the safe was open, that's when we would take down the store. It was 90 seconds at the beginning of the robbery. So when my dad and his girlfriend go in there and start talking, that's not the 90 seconds. It's 90 seconds from when Kev comes in and the guy's subdued. That's when we hit the clock. And that 90 seconds is done. I don't know what you have in your pockets, but we gotta go. So there were times we left a case behind. We didn't take everything. The 90 second rule came from bank robbers. They tell you that, that you cannot spend 90 seconds in a bank because if you go for the vault, it's gonna be more than 90 seconds and you're dead. Everything was based on Kev. He could subdue a victim. He was either cuffs or duct tape or sometimes just standing over him with the gun. So my brother would jump over the case, grab him and put him down. Say, just keep your mouth shut. We'll be out of here in a couple seconds. Nobody's gonna get hurt. My dad went after the safe, I went after the cases. One time we encountered a, a safe that when we opened, it didn't have what we thought was in it. Uh, and my dad just wasn't convinced. And he started fooling around with the bottom of the safe and he pressed it and popped up and everything was inside. The bottom was hollowed out. So I'd always have a ball peen hammer and those cases are not easy to break because they all have a layer of plastic in the middle. So when you hit it, just a hole. You have to keep smashing and eventually push down this whole piece of cracked glass into, and then it makes the items very difficult to get to. So that's why some of these cases, even the jewelry store windows, there were people in the 80s that would smash and grab through the window. My dad had rules. We tried not to hurt anybody. In the scenario that we were going into a store that wasn't ours, and we were looking to rob a traveling salesman, we would stage it so that when the guns were pulled out, they were only pointed at the victim. So we purposely didn't point them at the store owner so that the victim would say, hey, is he in on it? And that's exactly what happened. There was a plan that my dad had and wanted to hatch that we would go in and actually take down as many stores as we could in the jewelers building in Boston. And there was an actual building with five or six floors full of jewelers. It was something that we squashed because the front desk guy was a police officer. We never had to deal with any security guards because at the time there weren't many jewelry stores that required an armed guard be there. The only one was the double doors and we didn't even go in. And you'll notice that about most street level jewelry stores is there's a foyer and you cannot hold both doors open together at the same time. You'd have to go through one, take a, a number of steps before you get to the next one. And that's because they can lock that for you. And at that point, we're like, nope, most of these stores buzz you in. I can't get into a jewelry store now without being buzzed in. They don't use a high tech security system during the day because you have foot traffic. And that stuff, you know, are you talking about laser beams that are tripped once you go past them? Well, you can't use that during the day. There are alarmed cases now. But again, you have to consider who's responding to the alarm. When's the last time you did anything about a car alarm? If during the day, during business hours, an alarm is going off, I think for a good couple of minutes, most people are gonna think it's a fluke and wait for it to shut off. Most people's first instinct isn't to call the police when they hear that. So now you have a live armed guard in a, in a store now. I think the Pink Panther breaking and entering style jewelry store robbery went away when uh, security systems didn't have to be connected to your phone. So once a silent alarm can, once it's tripped, it can contact a satellite, the satellite calls the cops. You can't stop that unless you find a way to cut the electricity to that entire structure. And even then they have backup systems. So yes, if the power does go out, that security system's still gonna work. If we left in the stolen car, we would meet the Bronco, we'd throw everything in the back and I would go home. That's when I had the opportunity to start going through this stuff. We had to keep the stuff in the house. So we would have 500 to a million dollars worth of jewelry, retail, wholesale, that's probably about 100 grand worth of stuff. My dad would separate it into, here are the necklaces, here are the bracelets, here are the rings, here are the uncut gems, here are the cut gems, here are the set gems. From there, it's just putting them into packages that, that we could sell to Jewelry stores. High-end stuff is super, super, super hard to sell. You know, little little trinkets, little chains. My dad made more money off these little glass jars with little beads inside. If it sparkles, people will buy it. So for us, 
No, there wasn't a level of preference um, in terms of what you were grabbing. But if I, I got five cases in front of me and one's full of diamonds and one's full of gold chain, I'm going for that. The gold chain is way easier to sell quicker than a diamond ring is. You don't want to deal with uncut because then you got to go find a place to cut them. And that's not easy to do. I would rather sell you a set stone than a, than a loose stone because more of it's done and you can charge more for it you're charging for the gold. So when you go in and you buy a diamond now, you're paying for the diamond, you're paying for whatever the gold is in weight. Bill was our main dump site for a lot of the stuff. <laughs> was the other person. He was a jeweler in Nashua. And this was a guy that understood that, that the markup is where you make your money. And if you buy stolen stuff, you can mark the hell out of it. So if you buy it at 50 cents on the dollar, you can already just charge what, it, what you normally would, charge a little bit more and really, really clean up bought a lot of our stolen stuff in bulk. So, so getting rid of jewelry in bulk, very difficult to do, because as soon as you have your hands on it, you're an accomplice. So there's a, there's a lot to it. So you gotta understand, after a robbery, every single pawn shop is, you know, the cops say, if you see any of this stuff, you call us. So we couldn't just go to a pawn shop and say, here, buy all this stuff. We put it through piecemeal. So it's great to have a pocket full of diamonds, but if you don't have anywhere to dump it or, or fence it, and fencing is what we call the selling of stolen, stolen goods. Get caught buying fenced stuff and uh, you're screwed. And, and that's how most people get caught in these situations. Jewelry party is where you just invite a bunch, it's like a Tupperware party with jewelry. So come in and look at our product. We would lay everything out on the table, display it, and people would just look at it and it's cash. It's just a cash business. A lot of diamonds are laser inscribed with serial numbers. You can buy fake paperwork for this stuff. So at the time, it was rare that anything was engraved. The technology wasn't there and the technology was expensive. So you have now certifying bodies out there that will give you a certificate that says, this is the diamond you're buying and this is how it's graded and this is blah, blah, blah. But you can pay for those. One of the ways we used to tell was scraping glass. You might go into a jewelry store or a pawn shop and they'll take a little pen and they'll hit it with a little electrical current to tell if it's a real diamond. You're pretty much okay buying any gold, but you gotta make sure it's stamped. So if you have a piece of gold that's, you know, they say is 18 karat gold, but there's no stamp that says 18K, it probably isn't. Gold will not uh, magnetize. That might be a way. I used to try to, I'd take some of the stolen jewelry and try to sell it for drugs and they used to dip it in bleach because they say bleach reacts to the other metal that's in the gold. That's not true, it doesn't work. I'm not going to a store and buy jewelry right now because you're, you're paying an, an exorbitant markup and you don't know, you don't know if it's real. Some people probably looking at their hand right now wondering <laughs> whether or not what they have on their hand is worth anything, but um, well, diamonds are not rare. A flawless diamond is rare, but sapphires and, and uh, emeralds are way rarer, if that's even a word, because you just don't find them flawless very often, and you don't find them uh, treated or enhanced in some way uh, artificially. Most of the insurance scams that I observed were hearing secondhand what the person reported was stolen from their store. Every job that we did that Bill was able to go and talk to that person afterwards, without knowing that Bill was the one that helped rob him, we heard what he said was stolen. And it was always double, at least double. These guys are, are taking this, this problem and turning it into an opportunity. And that's why you're paying so much for insurance, is because these guys, insurance companies are getting screwed um, pretty bad. If you're really, really good at it, you will have knowledge of how many police are in that city, which is why we never pulled a job in Nashua, New Hampshire. Nashua, New Hampshire had one of the best police forces at the time. I grew up in Boston with organized crime. I, I wasn't in it, but we all knew the Angelos ran the state. We ran all of the waste management, all the construction. An entire section of Boston was devoted to strip clubs, drug dealing, and the second you stepped out of the combat zone and did any of that stuff, either in Anjulo or somebody from that crew or a cop would thump you for it. That was the place you did it. And it ran really well. Bulger comes in and it just became completely disorganized. No way we would have robbed 22 stores while the Anjulos were in power. They would have either come to us and asked for a piece of it, or they would have said, these stores are protected and you can't hit them.
when you think to yourself, how does a father get his sons involved in something like this? My dad lived a very different childhood than we did. He grew up in Chelsea, right next to Heller's Bar. Heller's Bar was a mob bar. Right behind Heller's was a huge dirt parking lot where frequently my dad would leave his house and see a tractor trailer pulled from East Boston docks, which where the mob picked up most of their stuff. They would park it in the back of Heller's and that's where they would sell everything. And my dad saw this. So my dad followed every rule, he went to college. He was an upstanding member of society unless there was something on the ground that wasn't tied down that he could take. And that was the mentality, I think, of most people in Massachusetts at the time. Pay your taxes, keep the man off your back, but if you see an opportunity to take a little something, grab it. My father initially gave this guy his life savings to invest in importing diamonds into the country. This guy decided to take that money from my dad and then tell him that he never got the delivery. And my dad was in a in a bad place. He was in a very bad place. He finally asked if we would help him. He finally just sat down and said, here's the deal. You guys are gonna have to come out of college. You're gonna have to work full time. I don't have any money to pay for any of that stuff. Or we could go get the money back from this guy and set him up. And that's exactly what we did. And it started um, the beginning of 22 other robberies. It started as we gotta save dad. And then my dad started presenting all the robberies to us as we're, we're helping people. We're going after this guy. He's dirty and he, he, this guy ripped people off and if we stop him, he won't rip anybody. It was like a Robin Hood kind of thing. After five, you start saying, hey, you know, we're not superheroes and, and we're not here to save the world. What are we doing? And, and that's when things started to get very, uh, we were, my brother and I were very worried at how much further this was going to go. The real victims are... Anybody that we stole their dignity, their right to freedom, their right to move about the world without somebody tying them to a chair and their families. It doesn't stop with them. It stops with uh, anybody that loved that person that had to hear about what happened to them. I was arrested on December 26th of 1996. There was enough distinctiveness about us to separate us from anybody else doing it. There weren't a whole lot of crews. There weren't a lot of multiple people doing jobs. I went to rehab and, and I stopped doing robberies. My brother and father continued. They did two more and then they did one after prison. But I stopped because I had sobered up and I went back to school to become a drug and alcohol counselor. My brother was always arrested. My father was already arrested. They were both sitting awaiting trial and I knew they were coming for me. To me, prison was a lot like criminal university. So many inmates would go in there and be like, okay, what did you do? How did you get caught? Okay, and they leave with knowledge of how to get away with it. So prison is a, it can be an education in terms of if you wanna keep doing what you're doing, that's the place to go and talk to the people that got caught and figure out how to do it right. I think the hardest part of my prison sentence wasn't the jail time, it's the, the stigma. I couldn't get hired. Regret sucks, man, it really does. It's not easy to live with. It was, it was ultimately my decision. And I, you know, I could say that I was 13 years old and wasn't capable of making those decisions, but I was 20. My father and brother passed away February 11th last year. My brother and I had a very difficult and complicated relationship. We very rarely got along. And when we bonded, it was in situations like this. So through our drug abuse, we bonded, through the robberies, we bonded, in prison, we bonded. But whenever we were outside, and needed something substantial to solidify that bond, it was never there. The book I wrote is called Family Jewels, and it was my attempt to use the book as a tool to talk to kids, to talk to people, to maybe use the how crazy this story is to, to kind of scare you straight. I work as a personal trainer now. Um, I created my own certification. Uh, I wrote my own book that lists um, the programming for this type of exercise, and it is now approved by three, four certifying bodies for personal training. I do the podcast, I do Family Jewels podcast. Podcast allowed me to go into greater detail. Uh, it allowed me to break down each robbery individually.
。要は、どこかのその境で、ヤクザのその美徳というものが、暴力とか、仁義であったり、筋であったり、そういったものから少しこう、変わってきた時代があるんですよ。そして今は、ほとんどが昇格のポイントになるのはお金をどれだけ上に上げてるかっていうのが今の現状です。だから僕は例えば組長時代に僕の代わりに刑務所にいた人間もいます。お金を稼ぐことばかり考えてたので、まあ今考えると良くないなというふうには思いますね。ね私がヤクザに入ったのは、えー、18歳の時です。大工。大工さんの仕事をしてた時に、えー、心臓と腰をやっっててしまってで、えー、その時に、えー、金融の仕事をしたかったんですね。でその金融の仕事をしたところがあ闇金融で僕の組長がいたところだった。組長から杯というものをもらいます。そしてその杯の中にお酒を入れてそしてサンドに分けて飲むんですねその杯を。こういう形でクックッこれで、えー、儀式が終わります。そしてその儀式が終わった時点で、親と子、子分と親分というものが成立します。ヤクザに入った時点で、えー、組織に対して、えー、名前を登録します。そしてその名前が登録された時点で、組織の方にはその名前が登録されちゃうんで、えー、警察が家宅捜査に入った時、その時に名前が割れてしまうんですね。警察の本部の方に登録をされて、えー、ヤクザの認定というふうな形になります。親分と会うときは基本的に、えー、親分の家というのは、えー、ドアが開きっぱなしです。出てこいと言われて出て行くときもあれば、もう何も言われずに顔を見せに来ましたというときもあれば、で、その中で、月に1回もしくは週に1回の、えー、ミーティングをして、会合というんですけども、会合をして、えー、いろんな報告をし合う。そして、えー、毎日、電話連絡で、定時連絡と言います。これを。朝と晩、捕まってないのかどうかの報告を本部に入れて、で、その、それを本部長が聞いて、えー、その本部長がまた、えー、自分の組長に、えー、知らせるっていう連絡体制は整ってます。基本的に、えー、親分と対立することは絶対に、許されません。しかし、えー、やっぱり人間なんで、えー、不満はあります。親分が、あ子分に対して、えー、やっぱりしつけというものはあります。やっぱり、うちの親分に関しては、ちょっと気性がすごく荒かったんですね。覚醒剤を使用した、もしくは、あまあ、組の中でやっちゃいけないことをやってしまった場合に、その時はやっぱりしつけとして、えー、ボコボコにされてました。指爪めというのはあ、けじめの問題です。で、えー、これがなぜ、じゃあ、小指を切るのかという部分に関しては、日本人は刀を持ってました。右で振るんではなく、刀って左で引くんですね。その時に、昔はあ、この小指がすごく大事だったんで、えー、その感覚をもうなくしてしまえと。と僕自身も実際指爪めをしました。えー、ここ、小指は、えー、亡くなっております。僕は親分が好きだったんですね。そしてその親分に対して一つだけ嘘をついてしまったことがあるんです。そしてその嘘に対して僕が耐えきれなくて、そして、えー、親分に対して申し訳ないという気持ちで指を詰めて持っていきました。まだ若干二十歳ぐらいだったんで、やり方がよくわかってなくて。これもね、えー、痛いかどうかも2パターンあるんですね。要は、上から落としてこい。指を詰めてこいって言われた時は痛いんです。でも、自分が悪いなと思って指を詰めた時、これは痛くないんです。要は、アドレナリンが出てるんですね。申し訳ない。持っていかないといけない。指を。組長が預かります。そして、その組長が、えー、神社の木の下に埋める人もいれば、事務所の、えー、冷凍庫に、えー、保管してる人もいれば、えー、事務所の神棚。に、えー、ずっと祀っている人もいれば、これはいろいろ形があります。その時からやっぱり僕は自分の組長のことがすごく好きだったんで、その僕のその愛情を、えー、組長が買ってくれて、21歳で行動隊長という、えー、役付けをいただきました。
22歳で刑務所に行くんですけども刑務所に行く前に僕が組織してた暴走族というチームがあるんですけどもそこから5年の刑務所に行ってそして、えー、出てきた時に若頭。組長がいて、そしてこの組長の下にはみんな古文なんですね。若頭というのは長なんです。若頭というのは、えー、ナンバー2ー。そして、えー、尽くしていくっていうことなんで、えー、それぞれがみんな尽くしていくところがあるんですね、組織には。なので、えー、組織が崩れずにしっかりまとまってるっていう部分です。日本のヤクザっていうのは、えー、親子の関係なんで、ヤクザの親子の縁というのは家族以上の絆であらないといけない。ヤクザに決まり事はめちゃくちゃあります。ただ、この決まり事に関しては守ってるところの方が少ない。人のものを取っちゃいけない。盗んでそれを利益にしちゃいけないっていう起きてもあります。でも、えー、盗みを、えー、仕事にしているヤクザも多いです。そして、人を騙しちゃいけない、詐欺をしちゃいけない、これも起きての中であります。なんか、すごく、なんだろうな、社会のルールを守れない人間たちばっかりなのに、ヤクザにはいっぱいのルールがあるんですよ。女性に関する事件を起こすなとか、犯しちゃいけないとか、そういったものもいっぱいあります。でも、えー、なかなか、それが守られてるってことはなかなかない。女性に関しては、えー、ヤクザの方もおります。ただ、稀です、これは。なかなかいない。でも、組織によっては、受け入れる方もおられるんでしょうけども、基本的には受け入れられない。ただ、僕の知り合いにも一人、えー、ヤクザをやってた女性の方がいます。その方に関しては、入れ墨も手首まで。そして、えー、小指もありません。ヤクザの全員が全員、えー、タトゥーを入れてるわけではありません。ちなみに僕は、えー、手首まで入っておりました。もともとはここまで入ってました。それを今、この分消しました。この両方。これだけで100万円です。ヤクザを見せかけてるような人もいっぱいいます。やっぱり、例えば、あこれは人間の潜在意識の問題ですけども、えー、入れ墨を出して歩く。これは、やっぱり見た目で人を威嚇しちゃうっていう、日本人独特のマナーというか、ルールというものがあるんですね。僕はもうそういう人を見ても無視します。ヤクザのいい部分に関しては、もちろんその人助けというものをしたりはします。僕が例えばなんですけども、宮城県の 3.11 の大津波、その時にボランティアで宮城県に行ったんですね。今の時代で言うと、どうしても、ヤクザに、えー、例えば、助けてもらいました。えー、もちろん、ヤクザに、助けてくださいと言えば、助けていただけます。でも、その後が、いろいろとやっぱめんどくさいんですよ。結局、あの時助けたから、今度はお前が、あの恩を返せと、いうふうになってくるんですね。とね、例えば、ヤクザにもほら、いろんなしのぎがあるんですね。で、そしてその中に、えー、っと、お正月とか、そういった時に、置物があるんですよ。江戸の。そういったものを付き合いをさせられたり、もしくは、あお正月の何かを買わされたり、えー、要は、毎月毎月、いくらか持ってこいとか、そういった部分で、えー、要は、恩を、そういうお金の形で返してこいっていうふうな、ヤクザが今多いです。ヤクザから例えばお金を借りて、えー、飛んだりとか、いなくなることを、えー、払わなくなっていなくなることを、えー、専門用語で飛ぶって言うんですけど、えー、これはめちゃくちゃ多いです。それで、えー、まあ見つかって、僕もこれは一回ちょっと経験したことがあるんですけど、えー、っと、うちの組からお金を借りて、そして、えー、逃亡して、そして見つかった。で、見つかった時に、えー、その当時、ちょっとこれは P 入れてほしいんですけども、えーの方に、えー、奴隷として、えー、300万で買い取るというふうなことがあったんで、それは派遣さ、えー、他の国に、えー、行きました。ヤクザが恐喝で、えー、お店からお金を取るというよりも、その、例えば、えー、キャバクラ、飲み屋さんですよね。から、そのキャバクラで何か問題があった時に、やっぱりお酒を飲むところって問題が生じるんですよ。
必ず。で、そういう時に、えー、店をむちゃくちゃにされたりとか、そういった時に、えー、ヤクザに連絡をして、で、そこで、えー、問題を解決してもらう。そして、えー、その、守ってもらってるっていう部分で、えー、毎月いくらかお金を払うっていうのをやってます。ただ、これも、えー、今のその時代になって、えー、要は、防犯条例っていうんですけども、この防犯条例が厳しくなって、えー、ヤクザと関わっちゃダメっていうのが色濃くなったんですね、社会的に。ヤクザが稼ぐ今一番多い、えー、しのぎに関しては、やっぱり覚醒剤。覚醒剤に関しては、えー、と僕の組に関して、絶対に扱っちゃいけないっていうルールを決めてたんですよ。なので、えー、他の人間はみんな覚醒剤を扱ってました。ヤクザに入ってどのぐらい稼ぐかに関しては、あそれぞれの、えー、器量だろうと思います。僕が、あ二回目の刑務所を出てきて、建築の仕事、そして風俗の仕事をやっておりました。風俗の仕事のお店だけで、だいたい毎月で言うと300万ぐらい。それから、建築の仕事がだいたい100万ぐらい。それと別で、恐喝とか、そういったものもやってたんで、それと別にもまた収入があります。ああそこで、政治とつる絡んで、公共工事を取って、そこからいろんな賄賂で、えー、公共、公共工事を仕上げていくっていうふうなのは、すごく横行してます。賄賂は。警察でヤクザ繋がってる人もいっぱいいます。えー、と、僕が始めたばかりの、えー、18歳の時は、まだ、拳銃を、えー、警察に提出して、これを警察が受け取れる時代だったんですよ。拳銃を、えー、自主という形で、えー、ヤクザからもらうと、これボーナスが出るんですね。日本はそもそも拳銃を認められてない国なんで、そして、えー、島国というものなので、なかなかあ武器の輸入がもともと難しい国ではあるんですね。ヤクザが使う拳銃に関してはほとんどがあ輸入してます。特に一番日本で使われているのはトカレフ。で、えー、その他で言うと、えー、改造拳銃、コルト製のアナコンダというモデルガンがあるんですけど、まあ、逮捕で言ったら11回あるんですけど、えー、僕が前回一般になった時に、えー、車を路中してたんですよ。そして、えー、違反で、えー、その車を警察署に持っていかれたんですね。夜忍び込んで、で、エンジンかけて、で、えー、持っていこうとしたんですけど、で、えー、前回二犯の時は、と、血糖剤と言って、これは、すごく珍しい、えー、犯罪なんですけども、昔、明治時代、日本の明治時代に、日本人が武士を辞めて刀を置いた時代があるんですね。それから、血闘罪というものが制定されたんです、えー。僕が面倒を見てた暴走族が、えー、と、対立する暴走族と喧嘩になったんですよ。で、それで、えー、と、その時に僕がその喧嘩を主催したっていうことで、百何十年前のえー、罪を僕に持ってきて、決闘罪っていうことで、これで、えー、刑務所に行きました。僕が、一回目の刑務所に行った時に、知り合った、えー、僕の組員がいるんですけど、この人間が出てきた時に、僕のお金を持って逃げたんですね。で、その探した時に、えー、たまたま見つかったんで、その時は、あハンマーわかりますあの、台。で、えー、バチバチ叩いて。で、えー、それで、えー、最後の刑務所、ね、3年間、勤めました。ヤクザというよりも、これは刑務所の合言葉っていうのがいっぱいあります。例えば、部屋の中で何か悪いことをするときに、見張りがいるじゃないですか。見張りのことを、しけって言うんですね。そして、刑務官が歩いてきたときに知らせることを、ず、ずって言って知らせます。その他で言うと、えー、そうですね、えー、スワットと言って、えー、親分を守る部隊が編成されてるんですね。その編成されてるところは、それぞれ組織によって合言葉っていうものはいっぱいあります。例えばですね、えー、ヤクザの世界に、地切りという言葉があります。で、この地切りというのは、えー、上から命令されて、誰かを殺してこいとか、そういった時に、えー、その
殺人を遂行できた人間に関しては、えー、刑務所に15年から20年、もしくは今の刑で言うと30年、えー、服しますんで、えー、その方に関してはかなり、えー、昇格されます。昔はヤクザが、えー、当たり前にみんなを守ってた時代があったんです。なので、昔はうざくなかったんです。でも、警察がどんどんどんどん力をつけてきて、要はこれは戦後の話ですね。えー、戦後からどんどんどんどん、えー、警察が力をつけて、ヤクザが必要なくなってきたんですよ。もう今、どんどんどんどん、えー、このヤクザという組織は、えー、停滞してます。っていうのが、犯罪者の数って減らないんですよ、どうしても。でも、今まで、えー、ヤクザという組織にいた人間たちが、今度ヤクザを辞めて、別の犯罪を犯し出すんですね。そうなると、えー、ルールがもうな、何もなくなるんですよ。今の若者がヤクザに興味がないのはもうしょうがないのかなとは思いますけどね。昔の時代で言うと、ヤクザがすごく栄えて、そしてヤクザがかっこいい時代があったんです。やっぱり、ヤクザとして一生懸命生きてる人たちもいると思います。でも、そうじゃない人たちの方が多くなってしまったんですね。ことは、やっぱりついていきたいって思う人も必然と減るんじゃないかなって思いますけど。刑務所から出てきた時に、えー、ちゃんとした仇になるんですけども、それがちょうど10年前ぐらいに、えー、刑務所から出てきました。これが最後の僕の犯罪です。えー、僕はちゃんともちろん辞めたんですけど、辞めたいと思って辞めますって言ってくる人間の方が多分少ないと思います。基本的にはもう何も言わずに飛んじゃう。恩人不通になる。これは、十人十色で、えー、いろんなその辞め方ってあるんですね。えー、例えば、えー、支援センターがあります。そういうところに、えー、相談に行って、どういうふうに辞めたらいいかという助言を聞くこともできます。何もかも筋を通さないといけないっていうわけじゃないんですよ。あの、ヤクザってのは結構筋にこだわります。正直。でも、この筋ってのはヤクザも都合がいいんですね。このヤクザを辞めて10年の中に、いろんな資格を取らせていただいたんですよ。要は、僕が、えー、資格を取ったのは全部建築の、えー、資格です。僕なんかで言うと、人よりも遅れてるわけですよ。30過ぎて、えー、普通の一般社会人になったんで。やっぱり日本人のその感覚の中に、やっぱり、刑務所に入った人を受け入れがたいっていうのはやっぱりそれはあります。要は、資格は今でも取れます。刑務所は。でも、一握りなんです。要はこれが、えー、一般社会に帰って社会復帰した時に役に立つのかどうかで言ったら、ほとんど役に立たないんですよ。建築の世界に入って、えー、建築の仕事をずっとやってました。そして、えー、兄の会社に、で、6年間働いて、そして、えー、自分で独立して、今4年目になるんです。そうですね、えー、僕が今、最も伝えたいもの、これはやっぱり、今まで犯罪を犯してきた人が、そこに囚われずに、えー、一生懸命やれば、人生って変えれるんだよっていうのを、すごくみんなに伝えたいなと思います。で、その保護観察っていうのを取得するためのその保護士さんっていうのがいるんですよ。そういったその保護士さんの資格をもらって、で、えー、なんか支援をしていけたらいいなっていうふうに考えてます。My name is Jeff Turner. I printed over a million dollars in US bank notes. And this is how crime works. I've been called the Picasso of counterfeiting. From my perspective, it wasn't that hard to do it, if that makes sense. It just took a lot of trial and error, basically. The bills just progressively got better and better until eventually got caught, and the Secret Service said the bills I was making were the best they've seen in 25 years. I started counterfeiting when I kind of found myself in a desperate financial situation.、Um, I wrecked a work truck, so I, I lost my job. And, you know, I had a newborn baby at home. The lease was up in our house.、Um, so I was just kind of, you know, in a desperate spot. I was just trying to think of, of some way to get my family back on their feet, you know. And counterfeiting just ended up being like the safest, easiest way.
The majority of the money I printed was the 96 series $100 bill. I also counterfeited some of the 2013, the new blue notes, but really that was more of like a hobby for me, like just kind of a challenge. The longest process to, to start counterfeiting was making the digital files. I would say I spent two months of just editing these images. Really, that like, Wikipedia has pretty high resolution uh, photos in their stock, and I broke the image down to multiple layers. So I would have one image of just the background color. I'd jumble up the serial numbers. I knew I needed to find a real thin paper that was opaque enough to where you couldn't see the strip and watermark through the face of the bill. I went through rice paper, vellum paper, tracing paper, you know, toilet paper, wrappers on toilet paper. I ended up finding that Bible paper was, was perfect. Bible paper glows a dull purple just like money does. I would acquire the Bible paper by going into like bookstores and just kind of taking out the blank pages. Inevitably, I ran out of bookstores in Knoxville. I would coat the bills with a matte lacquer spray can, which basically enabled the counterfeit detection pens to mark yellow. I would also use an invisible ink UV pen to draw an invisible line over the strip. I also found a certain type of iridescent green eyeshadow that I would basically paint on to the, the 100 in the bottom corner to kind of replicate the color shifting ink. One cashier would run her fingernail along Benjamin Franklin's shirt to kind of feel the, the rigid texture. I ended up going to like a Hobby Lobby and I found a, uh, like a fine tip glue pen. It would dry and give, give a little texture to his shirt. The 3D security ribbon on the modern $100 bill was hard to, to crack. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing um, kind of outsources a company to produce the paper and some of the security features. And I, I was able to find the patent rights, so it's like it basically explained how to do it. The trial and error was definitely frustrating. When I first started counterfeiting, um, you know, I would just experiment and I'd, I'd mess up five for every one that I, I made well. Towards the end, I could make a perfect counterfeit $100 bill in probably five or 10 minutes. I've had a few printers kind of break on me. Sometimes the paper would just get so jammed up. It's not so much noisy because I'm using digital printers, but the, the matte lacquer spray, uh, smells really bad. So a lot of times like maids at hotels would come into my room and thinking we're like huffing paint or like something I'd have to say, oh, my wife spilled nail polish or, you know, just make up these little lies. But eventually I rented a house and I had ventilation fans that would suck the uh, matte lacquer out the window. So I could kind of spray the bills in front of this uh, exhaust fan that it kind of sucked it out the window. There weren't really like big stockpiles of counterfeit money. I would try to like essentially launder the money um, every day, you know, so I'd print maybe 2,000, 5,000 um, in the morning and early afternoon, and then I'd try to break all those bills before the end of the night. There was probably like 10 or 20 of like the big corporations, retail grocery stores, you know, Walmart type type stores. And those were the best to, to break the bills at. I also sold bills to people. 25 cents on the dollar was kind of the going rate. If I was breaking a bill in a store, I would try to go to female cashiers. And if I sent women in with the bills, I would tell them to go to male cashiers. When I would break a bill, I'd give them the exact coinage to kind of distract them a little bit. The majority of your amateur type counterfeiters get kind of called out at the register and you know, they'll get a license plate number or something. And I would like always park my car far away um, so they could never get my license plate. I steered away from self-checkout machines because they were just too hard to beat. And some of them even have like photographic software where it just analyzes like the microprinting and all that stuff. In the beginning, I was definitely nervous um, because I spent so much time, uh, you know, perfecting these bills that I would notice any little, you know, error or anything like that. 
I think I've got an attention to detail that most people probably don't have. And, you know, the knowledge I have for the security features, I study extensively. There was a a few times that I would go to the same grocery store and it turns out that the bills I'd spent last week, they found out about them. But really most of the time when a cashier, even if the cashier kind of knows it's fake, they usually give it back to you. Over the two years that I was counterfeiting, I probably only had like maybe three or four cashiers turn me down. Um, and I was spending, you know, thousands of dollars every day. Luckily for me, they only had, I think, like 12 surveillance videos of me. Um, so I was pretty good about kind of staying anonymous. There was a uh, be on the lookout for me and my wife breaking a bill at a, a specific store. They didn't know my name, though. It was just a picture. The Secret Service has the capability of kind of building cases on people. But as far as local police, I mean, they can't really do much about it, you know. Knoxville has uh, a lot of dealers from out of town. Basically, drugs are more expensive in Knoxville than they are in Detroit or Chicago or Cleveland or Atlanta. So a lot of people kind of go to these mid-level cities to, to sell their drugs because they're, you know, you can get a brick in Detroit for like $25,000 and then cut it and go sell, sell it for, you know, $100,000 in Knoxville. I was addicted to drugs at the time. So a lot of it was buying, buying drugs with the bills. A few dealers I was honest with, and I would say, this is what I do. And I ended up selling some bills to a drug dealer from Cleveland. But there was a couple cases of I would buy drugs from these people with the counterfeit money. And the guy that actually ended up setting me up, um, I probably got him for like close to $10,000 over about a month's period. Um, and he said that it was raining one day and one of my bills got wet and the, the color shifting makeup smeared off. Um, so he found out that they were fake. He was just kind of impressed and you know wanted to start buying them from me. These people would drive from Knoxville up to Detroit to buy like a brick of heroin and they would mix in like five or 10,000 of, of my bills when they went to their city to, to re-up. All different stores have their specific method of detecting counterfeit bills. Um, and a lot of like the big retailers just use the counterfeit pens. So they typically just mark the bill. And then, you know, if it marks properly, they cash it. If someone's buying a real cheap item with a hundred dollar bill, that's probably more reason to take a closer look at it. Like looking for a, the, the strip and the watermark, uh, you know, holding the bill up to the light um, helps really the best way to tell if a bill's real is like putting it in a bill validator. This uh, is the more modern Blue Note $100 bill. If you hold the bill at a certain angle and shift it, the ink turns from a metallic green to a copper. It's used with magnetic ink. So if you fold a bill in half and set it on the table, you can actually lift it up with a neodymium magnet. There's enough magnetism to actually lift the bill up off the table. So some cashiers will scratch the shirt to feel a kind of rigid texture um, in the bill. The bills are printed on an intaglio press um, that kind of raises the ink above the paper, which gives it a certain type of uh, texture. Bills are really hard. There's kind of like a, a, a real crisp feeling to it. Well. Yeah, there is a smell to money, and my bills, I've had a couple people, uh, if I sprayed the matte lacquer, um, like, too soon to spending it, you know what I mean? Like, a couple people would complain of a smell. I mean, they always accepted the bills, because really, like, every security feature that a cashier would look for, my bills had. Um, so even if they were kind of suspicious, or even brought up something like the smell, uh, you know, they still accepted it because there was really no reason to believe it was counterfeit. It was 2019. The dealer from Cleveland, he got arrested up there. He either got caught with my counterfeit money or heroin. And, you know, it didn't, didn't take him long to inform on me. And then from there, you know, the Secret Service raided my hotel room.
I was in the process of printing when they kicked the door in. So they found computers and printers, and I think I had like 6,400 in counterfeit bills um, that I tried to flush down the toilet. They pretty much caught me red-handed at that point. I was basically looking at like about three years, but the Secret Service uh, came to me and basically said that if I pleaded guilty um, and showed them how I did everything, then they wouldn't charge my wife uh, with anything and they would give me cooperation credit and they'd keep my restitution amount under $100,000. So with the, the cooperation, um, that got reduced to 10 to 16 months. The maximum sentence is 20 years. I think, you know, white collar criminals should still go to prison. I mean, I deserve to go, you know, to prison. I was lucky with uh, the amount of time that I served. It got me sober. Really, it was for the best in, in my particular case. There are organizations in other countries, uh, you know, that have taken a liking to counterfeiting. It's obviously extremely profitable. And, you know, I've heard that a lot of counterfeits come out of Lima um, and, you know, Medellin. I've seen some bills that I was told came from, from like South America, but the quality wasn't uh, very good, I didn't think. It's criminal organizations in the drug trade. And just like in, from my experience, you know, people who were in the drug trade Obviously, they're opportunists, you know, if there's a way to make money any other way, um, from my experience, you know, they'll, they'll do it. There's a, a super note, they say, most likely coming out of North Korea, produced by the North Korean government, that is indistinguishable from a legitimate currency. It supposedly has not only all the security features, but all of them done pretty flawlessly. I started counterfeiting when I was 19 years old. I read The Art of Making Money, a book about Art Williams, who was a counterfeiter up in Chicago. And that kind of gave me the original idea, but everything else was kind of like my own methods. The bills weren't super sophisticated, but they were good enough to, to sell. A friend of mine's dad uh, was kind of like a connected guy in Tampa but then my friend overdosed um, and died. I basically just stopped doing it. Um, you know, at that point, I didn't want to get caught. And of course, when I started up again later on, it, it's all because of, you know, just a desperate financial situation uh, that kind of, you know, I was racking my brain uh, for any ways to make quick money. I don't think, you know, there will ever be a way to prevent counterfeiting. Um, you know, even if it goes digital, there's still ways of counterfeiting cashless. Like a person I know was counterfeiting credit cards. The million or so dollars that I had made um, over my career hasn't impacted the economy much, I would say. But, uh, you know, maybe on like the local level, it, it might make people lose trust in, in cash. In fact, a lot of stores in Knoxville don't accept $100 bills anymore. They've got little signs uh, at like Dollar General's and, and certain stores that I frequented. Obviously, you know, the, the, this whole situation kind of flipped my life upside down. Um, you know, I'm sure it wasn't easy on my kids. You know, I, I had to go to prison. Um, my wife and I are now separated. So, I mean, it's it's been, uh, you know, rough on on all of us. Now I am uh, the production manager at a printing and graphics company um, in Knoxville. So yeah, just uh, still printing, just not, uh, nothing illegal. My name is Stephen Gillen. It was estimated that I stole over $5 million worth of high value goods as the leader of an organized burglary gang. This is how crime works. Our burglary gang would always carry some kind of weapons, but that is to control the situation. The emphasis is not to hurt people, but to command dominance without any fuss or unnecessary violence. Mm -hmm. 
I was operating in the late 80s, early 90s, all around the greater London area and the home counties. My first introduction to the gang was just people that we hung out with and you know grew up with pretty much. Burglary gangs pretty much always know each other already. They may have gone to school together or they know each other's brothers or they would have worked with each other in another form of organized crime. This is the way our gang was formed. I was a leader of a gang of four, sometimes five people. You'd have the lookout guy who was the eyes, who would drop us off. You'd have the muscle, he would be the brute force. And then you'd have the jack of all trades. He would also bring a lot of information. And then you'd have someone there who was always really savvy with alarms, with sensors. There were a couple of times where people, you know, would be arrested. It's the nature of this game. Many times we would not want to bring anyone else in because we would be able to replay that and execute what had to be done anyway. But on rare uh, occasions, if we needed another body, as it were, there were always a selection of people within our groups. Scouting for properties is a role all by itself. The properties the gang would target, one would be ones that we were sent to with specific information, usually knowing there were high value items in there. Others, there would be surveillance on them, they would be watched. Information could be from a disgruntled employee and just other people even close to the family. I think all this posting uh, and showing of uh, wealth on social media, where people live, what they're doing all the time, is very, very dangerous. It was different back then when we was active, but I know now a lot of really high-end burglary gangs that specifically go into the uh, go onto the internet, and that's where they get their targeting. Kim Kardashian is a name. Professional footballers. They're very susceptible to that happen to them. And it was very easy even to pick the time when to go to the properties because they'd be posting saying, I'm at the Oscars or I'm away at, you know, Switzerland for the weekend filming. A burglar decodes a target in a certain specific way. First thing he's looking at is going to be the weakest part, you know, of the building. Houses which are semi-detached Houses that are on the corner of the road or have a lot of shrubbery would be a target. People going there, you know, in uniform as a postman or a worker or whatever. This is so if anyone's looking out the window or watching or passing in the car, they look like they have every reason to be where they are. A great deterrent, it's not a full deterrent, is that places would have a new alarm. Dogs is another one. When they see obstacles like this, they're more likely to move on to an easier target. Our gang, you'd come aware of a dog and the barking, but look, there have been times it's very easy to get a nice bit of meat, put loads of Valium or whatever in it, and sling it over the fence or put it into the dog's kennel. The best time for, for the gang to, to approach a target really varies, which is why the surveillance and the location are very, very important. Commercials were generally more at night just because of during the day there'd be a lot of people in these units. Smashing glass is not just noisy, it's very messy. And if you're climbing through glass, then you have a big percentage of leaving DNA blood and all these kind of samples. It wouldn't be our preferred entry point. Overpowering or circumventing private security is something a burglary gang would not want to do. They'd look at ways to get around that. In them days for us, security codes in residential properties, you know, would usually have four or five numbers so there were uh, technologies that we had that could plug into that to uh, release the number, you know, and then you had safes and there was different ways to drill safes or, you know, in some cases like the old days, people would even blow them, but not so much. We would be looking 
to do as least work as possible. So it was basically about dismantling the alarm systems, you know, and getting through that first level of protection. We had other, other um, techniques that we used to use, which was a building foam, which we could put into an alarm system that would harden. So the bell wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, to ring, but then we'd have to do the same on the internal alarm system. You know, other ways into a building, you know, it's, it's the understanding of alarms and how they work. It's usually, if it's not sensor, uh, sensor lead, you would know it would be metal on metal for doors. So sometimes we would just chop the whole bottom of the door off and pull that in, uh, uh, the bottom out, the alarms wouldn't trigger and that would give us the valuable time that we would need to get to the internal alarm system and disable it. Our gang wouldn't necessarily target homes or commercial properties with people in them, but sometimes we did. Our burglary gang would always carry some kind of weapons, not heavy weapons like guns, but that is to control the situation. The emphasis is not to hurt people, but to command dominance, to get the work done without any fuss or unnecessary violence. People would always uh, comply because we was very professional in our, in our approach. The places people would hide items, usually, they're just out there in a master bedroom or in a cupboard or in a jewelry box. A lot of other times they'll be in the safe. Sometimes the safe is open. We have found some of this stuff in the most unbelievable places, in the back of cupboards, rolled up in socks, in the back of drawers, even under the bed and the mattress. One of the most uh, successful burglary jobs we done me and the gang was a commercial uh, that had a lot of really high-end designer goods. It had alarms, it was um, in central London. It was a very, very busy location. We had been given um, information about this place. On this job, we left two people outside on the road as lookout. So only two of us went in as the main, as the main lead. I was one of them. Once we got over the outer, through the outer doors and into the courtyard, there was only a really, really flimsy, you know, alarm, but we put the foam into the alarm. We started wrapping up the stuff. We had someone out there. They reversed the van in and we loaded that van very, very quickly. That was taken then to what we used to call a slaughter. And a slaughter was where the goods would be unloaded and then moved on to the buyer. Getting rid of the proceeds of a burglary is one of the most risky times. But sometimes we would be stuck with certain items. I remember once we had a stamp collection, which come out of a state, uh, safe. Because of the rarity and the misprints on some of these stamps, which was what made them valuable in the first place. It was very hard to find a buyer for these. Their great value translated to a much lower price, which we had to take. We had uh, very key influential jewelers in London who would break up the stones, who would weigh the gold, who would be able to move any amount of jewelry on very quickly. We had other people who was in the antiques market they were actors, middlemen. The paintings, guys, they was a different market. You know, and I had a couple of people who worked in that area and it was very specialized, you know, and they would usually always go to private collectors. The retail price of diamonds or jewels or gold or antiques is greatly diminished by the time it goes to the black market. If you had a 50 grand diamond, you'd more than likely go and get 12, 13 for it. With gold, you'd get a quarter of the price scrap. There were many times I had paintings worth hundreds of thousands. You'd be lucky to get a few thousand for some of these paintings. I think the market in stolen goods for burglary gangs is pretty much the same. There is a tendency now to go for a lot of high performance cars because they can be shipped abroad 
replated, and there's a lot of money in this um, to order. The gang always broke down profit four ways, five ways, whoever was involved, and depending on how much of a leading role they had in any given job. Some would fund a lifestyle of, of, of drugs and parties and going out. Others, it would be cars and watches or women even. Sometimes the money was definitely used uh, to invest in the next job. Needed equipment or even to pay off someone who was giving us new quality information. Our uh, burglary gang was um, independent. We didn't have to kick money up to anyone else. Everyone was part of a wider, high-level criminal network. In my time, London's underworld, its organized crime circles, were very tight-knit circles, but loosely affiliated. There were some corrupt officials and corrupt police officers who sometimes would want to get damaging paperwork or would target rivals. Due to the crimes I was committing, I ended up in prison. My further sentences related to organized crime, I was given 17 years, which I served as a category A prisoner. Many people talk about crimes they've done, crimes they missed, other crimes that are out there and can be revisited or done again. It was an education, a university of crime. Sometimes you come across some really you know, clever guys who will tell you about alarms and safes and locks, which, which could be applied. I first met Charles Bronson because of our level of security category within the prison system. Charles Bronson was a larger than life character. He was an amazing storyteller and an artist. He was a very, very funny man. And he could switch at any time. He had to be managed very, very carefully. I never had a problem with him. I think uh, sometimes long sentences are, are a deterrent. It's more about the lifestyle, the upbringing, and the conditioning. These people need more opportunity, and they need to be helped and given education and the right um, role models. In the UK, sadly, home invasion burglaries have been on a steady increase year by year now. I don't think police in the UK are doing enough to respond to non-violent crimes. In many ways, these are put on a lower tier of um, urgency. And of course, um, alarm systems are so much more sophisticated now. Everywhere is covered by cameras, drones, directional mics, all kinds of different ways of tracking criminals. This has led many criminals to go into cyber crime and more faceless um, areas of crime. I was released from prison from my final sentence, which was possession of a firearm in 2006. So many years had passed, 12 years, so the members of the burglary gang from the old days had dispersed. It's not conducive to having a family life. Everyone around you suffers, and I knew I needed to change my life, but everyone around me was either dead or in prison. And I went on to, to work real honest manual labor. Within 18 months, I went from laborer to supervisor to running my own contracts to starting my own business I'm a CEO, co-founder of Raw Media Creative Studios, which is a brand development, TV and film digital agency. I was born in England, but as a six month year old child was taken to Belfast uh, and left there in the middle of the war over there. It was a normal occurrence to hear the bombs and guns. I was brought up in an environment of fear, constant violence. My surrogate mother died of cancer when I was nine years old. So I was going back to England and London, which was alien to me. I had a succession 
of children's homes and foster homes where the basic road for me was to survive. Some of them was quite brutal, but there was a lot of learning uh, from the older ones above me about what to do. And that was the start of the grooming of crime. I'd have guns and the really serious violence around me from the ages of 15, 16. I was exposed to that very quickly. From that point on, it was, it was very much a grooming thing from the older ones. They saw, here's one we can manipulate, here's one who can be sent out there, you know, here's one who I see myself in that's going to be useful to us. And so it translates up the ladder.